Hello, everybody. Hello. And welcome to the podcast. My name is Micah McCaw. My name is Jordan McCaw. And we host the McCaw Podcast Universe, which is what you are listening to. Yes, and we exist to prove people wrong when they say sequels are never better than the originals. That is why we exist, and we have been going through the plethora that is X-Men. Yes. And we are, we're at somewhat of an ending point. Because okay. this is the end of the Wolverine, wink, wink, kind of, sort of. Yeah. Um, and we've gone through his three movies, and today we're talking about Logan. And with us we have host of Another Pass, uh, host of Men of Steel, Case Aiken. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, no, this is great. I was on your podcast. I'm assuming by the time this episode comes out, it was several months ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we talked about The Island of Dr. Moreau, one of the weirdest movies I have ever seen. Yeah, it was uh, a strange experience to revisit that movie for the first time since like junior high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you want a jumping off point to, to join into the Case Aiken world, uh, you should start there because that was <laughs> very fun. Um, but today we're talking about not a bad movie, <laughs> no, not a movie no. plagued by production. I think we're talking about a pretty excellent movie. Mm -hmm. I, I think that if there's any movie that articulates the idea that a sequel can be better than its predecessor, uh -huh. oh my God, this movie is so much that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I'm curious because, you know, I always send over the list of the movies we have scheduled and there was a lot to choose from. And uh, you gravitated toward X-Men. And I, I wanted to hear your experience with the X-Men movies and comics, if you have that too, um, and then this movie in particular. Why, why did you choose this? Yeah, I, I don't. Did we say the title today? We're talking about Logan. Uh, so I think I may have uh, cut you off there. <laughs> no, I did. I did say it. I think, but maybe I didn't. I don't know. I don't know. We're Doesn't matter. We're talking about Logan. Yeah. <laughs> it's important to know that. Look at your phone. See what you're listening to. <laughs> and that's the kind of stuff you're going to get with his podcast. <laughs> Him saying the name of the movies. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I am on point and made good notes, yeah. <laughs> um, so so I, I guess we'll start with X-Men in general. Uh, I was, I mean... 90s kid so like obviously the x-men animated series was a big thing for me mm -hmm. although honestly my first introduction to x-men in general was the six-player konami arcade cabinet that was all Whoa. about because i was uh like obsessed with arcades and video games when i was like very very little uh and cool. so that was my first introduction and then the show came out and i was like cool uh and like in the opening credits for wolverine like scratches his claws and has like an arc of sparks and it's just like the special effect he can do in the X-Men game. And I was like, yeah, it's the same thing. This is great. I love it. Um, and, and that cartoon is, it is really solid. Like uh, it's very fondly remembered. It has that Ron Wasserman, like opening theme song that people love. Uh, it's, it's so much fun. Uh, and that, that was one of my big gateways into comics. Like, um, cool. Like that, like the, the Adam West Batman show, um, like and, and this is the era when like the Tim Burton Batman movie came out and like mm -hmm. the, all of a sudden there was the Dini verse and uh, that was a big like thing for me to be like oh I should check out the comics especially because like there was a um, an adaptation of the cartoon as a comic so that was like a really easy jumping on point where it was like okay this is an episode or half an episode like in this like oh sure paper form. Um, so that that's how I like got into comics, and then I got really into comics because I like <laughs> hyper fixated on things. So uh, uh, I became what would be called a comic guy, uh, as as evidenced by the fact that I host a comic book podcast. <laughs> uh, so a a X Men was like huge in the nineties. Like it was the it was the era of Jim Lee and like of, of doing these like crazy like record number sales for all these books i was buying all of them at the time marvel had the trading cards so i was buying up those and being like intimately familiar with all these characters that had like one appearance uh and i was like right, wait right. <laughs> like what do you mean micro max isn't an important character <laughs> uh, and so and that continued throughout the 90s and then uh and and then the movies came out and the, like you know the first movie just blew me away especially mm -hmm. with that opening sequence uh set at Auschwitz uh mm -hmm. like trying oh, to yeah. like sell like okay this is like what the whole mutant thing is about and yeah. it was so incredible like to to actually realize it on screen even if Hugh Jackman was way too tall for the part of Wolverine <laughs> <laughs> Yeah <laughs> right people's number one complaint right 
Uh, but he knocked it out of the park yeah. in terms yeah. of the actual performance of it all. Like, it, like there were so many subtle things in that first movie that I loved. Like the fact that every time like he would headbutt someone, there was like this metal ring sound to oh, it, yeah. like yeah. from the from the metal bones. Uh, the fact that it was actually a school, which at the time the comics had never really leaned into like making it like a, a school proper with like classes of students like it, it was like here's our team they're they're students yeah. technically <laughs> yeah yeah i guess i never thought about that but I, i've read a lot of the um oh my gosh my brain is not working the most Cl- chris claremont run yeah um and uh and yeah it's it's more like hey we're students okay back to the battle room now what's magneto doing and yeah i guess there's not really like a class focus I, right. I, had, I never and put it, that together. It was starting to get more so because they added the New Mutants. And then uh, around the time, you know, uh, somewhere in the 90s, they added Gen X after they did the Age of Apocalypse story. And you started having like, more, like just because the book is cumulative, like they would add more and yeah. more characters. So eventually it would start to have like a feel of like, oh, here's the new class of students that came in. Yeah. Um, but really, like the movie was the first one where it's like, <laughs> no, 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 it is actually a school like they're, <laughs> yeah like, like it's not just like they're getting tutored and then like oh yeah. back to the danger room it's yeah. like no like professor x is teaching english right now <laughs> like everyone <laughs> right, gather right. around <laughs> um and then that was p- ported over uh because grant morrison then picked up that idea and brought it over t- when th- when they took over um doing new x-men or like what what had been x-men but they re- like relaunched the book uh mm-hmm. under yeah. that so that that whole like aesthetic was brought into the comics and I thought that was really cool. Um, and then Marvel decided to de-emphasize X-Men. And so I kind of lost focus on it because there, it just, the MCU became a bigger thing and right. sort of like lost, uh, lo- lo- lost its position as being like the main right. point in the, in the Marvel universe. Um, and it was also just harder for me as like an adult to like keep up. And then <laughs> the current era of Krakoa happened uh, and I got super back into X-Men comics like crazy because this is a golden age of X-Men comics that we're living in right now. So I've gotten very back, very far back into it um, oh, good. and really, really happy with it all because it's like it, they've made it very accessible for someone who like l- l- like like you. I went back when I was in, uh, in high school because I had all the like the essential collections of like the Chris Claremont yeah. era and I had all the Jack Kirby stuff from before that before, as, as well. So I like knew that foundational history. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was like a good chunk of like 2005 to 2015 that was just like a blank slate for me. And it was great yeah. to be like, oh, OK, they've made it easy for us to come back. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is nice. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 modern comics. I pretty much just only read Amazing Spider-Man, and then and then just select other things when they when they pop up. Um, but that's partially because I'm trying to read a bunch of the older stuff. So it's good to hear X Men are doing well. I'll, I'll oh, keep that in mind as as they get updated on Marvel Unlimited. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fantastic stuff. Like, uh, they they pulled out all the stops when the pandemic happened and they weren't really sure if the book was going to be able to keep going because, like, comics in general, like, shut down for, like, three months. Um, yeah. And so they, they did this big crossover called Ten of Swords, which was just fantastic. Doing It was doing a tournament arc, like, but... Oh. Having it be extremely interesting and engaging and uh, with this new status quo of characters uh, that really like cemented what was this new era and like why we care about all these characters. And they've done just incredible work, like taking like either bit villains and like rehabilitating them in really interesting ways or like changing the dynamics that have uh, allowed certain characters to go from being like stock villains to being like very compelling or, Mm -hmm. you know, minor, like a lot of, a lot of characters who had like hinted at like backgrounds, like, like a lot of characters were coded gay back in the time. And like now we're Uh like able to like fully like discuss it with, with some of them. And like, it's really cool that, that all the stuff that used to just be in the backgrounds, like subtext is allowed to allowed to breathe in, in the current era. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good to know. Now I got a jumping off point when I'm, when I'm ready. Um, so so what is your what's your history with Logan though specifically? Okay. So I saw Logan opening night. Yeah, um, of course. I, yeah, so this is actually one where by the time Logan came out I was already podcasting. Uh so we were the the network that I'm on certain point of view, the the flagship show for it which is 
ended since, but at the time was running, we would do uh, midnight screenings for movies and like give our immediate like, oh, reactions. Cool. So like, oh, we okay, did cool. we did Logan and then like immediately I like got ho- like hopped on a podcast and like we were discussing our thoughts about it. all. Oh, that's cool. So if you go searching on our YouTube channel, you can find a video of me discussing like my like immediate reaction thoughts to it. Yeah. OK, cool. Um, so then you and me, I remember we saw it in theaters and this was that weird point listeners will know if you've listened for a while. This was the weird point where I was kind of like, yeah, sh- I'm kind of done with all the superhero movies. And yeah. it's before I get back into it fully again and before I start reading comics again. So the idea of like a pretty self-contained movie that was rated R and was looked different Mm -hmm. and was not trying to like build a universe was extremely appealing to me. And, uh, so I, I remember we went and saw it and I actually, what's funny is I was like, yeah, that was good. Was kind of my opinion. Crazy. And, and I realized what it was, was I think, I think when I was, in 2017, I think I wanted them to make The Joker of Wolverine, which is a movie, in my opinion, that actively hates its source material. And so I thought that this movie, I guess every time it was making references to X-Men and all yeah. this other stuff and mutant stuff, I was like, come on, just do the, you know, leave all that out. And then when I watched it the other night, I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I love that it, it it is its own unique movie, but it also is embracing its source material and it's not trying to be like, look how stupid comics are. It's like, no, we love this stuff and you love it too, but we're also going to tell a unique story. Yeah. So I was Mm. crazy. I I completely reject (laughs) my original opinion. I did like it, but I wasn't like, but now you love it. I wasn't blown away, but yeah, I mean, to me, this is clearly the best of all the X-Men movies. Like for, for me at least, there's no question. Yeah. Um, but I mean, as far as X Men, X Men movies, it's still X Two. It's still X Two. That movie <laughs> rules. Um, but yeah, so so that was my original thought on the movie. What about you? I know for me, at this point, uh, I think I had seen the first two X Men movies while in college, but didn't really care or remember them. Um, so I'm sure when Logan was coming out, you this is like we like had just been married, I think. Well, it actually depends on what month. This no, movie we would have been getting married later oh, okay. that year. So, I mean, I was probably just like, yeah, Mike, you were like, let's go see this new Wolverine movie. And I probably, it was as simple as me saying, okay. <laughs> and I did. And I probably, I, I trust your opinion. So, and you were saying it was going to be great or something. You were yeah, highly yeah. anticipating it. So I think I was just like, yeah, okay, fine. I hope I'm not bored. And I loved it. I loved yeah. it so much. It, you were was, on board right away. I was. None, and none of my stupid qualms. What was great <laughs> about it is I'd only seen the first two. Like I said, hardly remembered them. Um, in a way, probably had a lot of questions, but also in a way didn't because it was so self-contained. Yeah. That it didn't really matter that I not I didn't know like tiny little details. Right. Maybe. Um, watching it the when we watched it the other day, it was my second time. And it was like just being reminded how incredible this movie is and how like, I don't think it made me cry the first time, but it definitely made me cry this time. Yeah. It was, was so it the good. ending yeah. that got you? Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty dang good ending. It's to so a movie. good. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's an incredible third act with yeah. Like yeah. really, really bringing Laura and Logan together uh, and making them like a family unit just to like rip it away. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't, I definitely didn't know, prior to this, the first time I saw it, that Wolverine is like eight, like ages. Like he's lived for a very long time. I had no yeah. idea about that. Um, so now watching it this time with some context on who he is and like, he's sick and he's weak yeah. now. And it's like that, that is more impactful this, this time around for me. Uh-huh. That this guy is weak now. Well, and, and it's fun watching like the progression of, the Wolverine, a movie that we watched for the first time doing this series. And I was like, oh, this movie rocks. Yeah. I, I, uh, really good movie. I, I think the third act really kind of falls apart a mm-hmm. little bit, but it's still a good movie. Mm-hmm. And so it was did, cool. Did you watch to, the extended cut or the theatrical cut for that? Theatrical. Okay. Is uh, is the extended cut the way to go? It, it yeah, it, it 
like I, I would argue that the Wolverine is the prototype for this movie. Yeah, uh, it's, it, it, that's exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, it, it's James Mangold and and uh, Hugh Jackman like being allowed to like flex their Wolverine stuff. But the theatrical uh-huh. cut, I think, is um, it's toned down in a way that like prevents some of the fun things that they wanted to do with the character to really like live. Um, and so the extended cut gets closer to it, and then this movie is them being like, "Oh wait, here, here's how we do it." Like, and they had figured <laughs> oh, out all okay. the pieces. Like, cool. okay, okay. Well, we'll have to be on the lookout for that next time we need. Another uh, Wolverine an, fix. Um, yeah, because we will. We definitely yeah. will. Um, yeah, because like the Wolverine came out and it was the best Wolverine movie that had ever been made at that point because its predecessor was, well, you know, X-Men yeah, Origins yeah, yeah, Wolverine, yeah. which is like <laughs> infamously bad, even if there's like a yeah. couple cute scenes in it. Uh, right. And then like you're like, all right, all right we're going to get Logan fighting ninjas. Awesome. Like there, <laughs> yeah. there's a bullet train. This, you know, it's all the things that we like loved about like the Frank Miller, like Wolverine mini from the 80s. And like, cool, we're, do- we're doing all that. And then you get this movie and you're like, oh, wait, never mind. That movie is like nothing. <laughs> compared to this yeah that's so true <laughs> yeah um and 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 it's cool I, I like it's it's a fun thing with franchises sometimes because sometimes it has a, a negative stuff but it, it's cool when like a filmmaker is working on something and then they like keep doing that thing and you get to see them like grow with the property so you're talking about james mangold specifically before yeah we... yeah so i love that idea of like he comes on he's he's already like a pretty weather director he's done a lot of stuff he's had some huge hits yeah and then he makes the wolverine which could be seen as potentially like you know he just wants to pay some bills so he can do another you know project yeah that that is that is less but he actually made it awesome yeah he made it awesome and then he he returns so it's like oh he really enjoys this and then he does something that's even more like auteur driven than the previous entry and so I, I love seeing when someone is like, I'm going to keep taking this. Yeah. And, and and I'm actually very invested, even though this is in a larger universe and stuff. I'm willing to fight for this to be the thing that I think it should be. Well, Micah, I just wonder if that is any good indication for the Indiana Jones movie. And he really yeah. <laughs> is heavily invested in Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah. When we were watching Logan, I was like, okay, maybe, maybe Indy will be okay. But... <laughs> I, it could just it could simply be a case of I, I have a different idea for what Indiana Jones should be. Yeah. Because of the four movies that they've made and the trailer seems to promise something completely different than what four movies of Indiana Jones have been. Uh-huh. But maybe I'm wrong. These are trailers. These are trailers. Uh, you know, they've they fooled me before. That's that's for certain. I remember thinking the trailer for uh Shazam was terrible and I went and saw the movie as a joke. And I was like, okay, this is the best DC movie. I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I I hope I am fooled. I hope I'm fooled. Um but yeah, so let's let's talk about the the people and how this was made. Uh obviously we already talked about James Mangold. Uh the screenplay is by Scott Frank, who uh he wrote Minority Report, Marley and Me, and he wrote and I don't know if he directed all, but he directed some of Queen's Gambit for sure. Oh, okay. Uh James Mangold is on screenplay as well as story by. And then Michael Green also did a pass who did uh, Alien Covenant, Blade Runner 2049, and Murder on the Orient Express. Okay. A uh, very strange collection of movies there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, two of them may. I guess Murder on the Orient Express is just strange in the same sentence as Alien Covenant, Blade Runner, <laughs> and this movie. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> Um, the cinematography is by John Matheson. We've talked about him. Uh, the music is by Marco Beltrami. We've talked about him. The score to this, get out of here. Awesome. Great score. Yeah. And he, he did the score for Wolverine, I believe. And, uh, I remember that score being awesome. I'm just always impressed when a score in a superhero movie leaves an impression. Yeah. Because it's so easy not to. Yeah. And this one's great. Mm -hmm. The use of the harmonica, get out of here. Love it. Um, the movie comes out March 3rd, 2017. It has a $97 million budget. Domestically, it makes 226 and worldwide, it makes 619 I'd say that it paid off. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the production. Uh, Scott Frank, who's one of the writers for this movie, as we just discussed, he is one of the writers on The Wolverine, and... 
I did not know this. I did not find this in my research when we were doing that episode. He has this to say in an interview about Logan. He said, There was a lot of pushback from the then powers that be with the Wolverine to get back to the giant robots and all the other stuff. But what was really fun for us was the character study of this man alone in the middle of Japan and out of his element. So it sounds like the things we did not like in that movie were studio mandated. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So that makes me As is like often the movie the case more. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it, it, you know, like I feel like a lot of times with these big franchise movies, you can tell when the creative people are not as interested in elements. Uh huh. And that's how the the big silver samurai at the end is kind of like, oh, this is just here now, I guess. Right. Um, and so finding out that no, they didn't really want to do that. Interesting. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Jerry Seinfeld uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> was not the name I was expecting you to say <laughs> I know I, I left a breath there um, he was talking with Hugh Jackman Okay, and he is one of the reasons this movie gets made in an odd way okay. need more information <laughs> so Hugh Jackman has this to say I was having a chat with Seinfeld about a year ago he was talking about why he finished Seinfeld He said he'd always had this feeling and belief that you never know when either your energy or the audience energy is going to dip over into people saying, oh, please go. And so Jackman was like, maybe it's time to end Wolverine. Oh, but he said a maybe. So it allows him to because he's he's apparently going to be in something. Well, so by all accounts, if we had recorded this episode I don't know, last year we'd be saying, like, this is the end of Wolverine, like, Hugh Jackman, you know, there was even, like, a media campaign that Mm -hmm. was, like, no more, like, this is it, Mm -hmm. Hugh Jackman's Mm -hmm. never gonna return, and then last year they announced in Deadpool 3 that he is starring in Deadpool 3 with Deadpool. I mean, in Deadpool 2 they announced that for Deadpool 3. No, last year they announced for Deadpool 3 they cast Hugh Jackman. Yeah, 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 okay. So, um, I guess we'll talk about that when that movie comes out, um... Yeah, it's hard to say how much he's going to be in it and in yeah. what capacity. Like, well, I, I I think we are going to wait and see. But this is also still in the era of it being a Fox production and not fully bought out by Disney yet. So, yeah. right, yes, this, this can also just be seen as like the conclusion of the Fox Wolverine story that they were telling. Mm-hmm. Right. Um. And and on the one hand, it's like comics are so rebooty and and they change all the time and stuff. So it's fine that he's going to be in it, and I I hope I hope it works. But it is a it it is a little bit of a bummer for this movie, in in my mind, from my reaction to the news okay. that that he is cast. I was not like, oh, I'm so excited about this. I was like, oh, but that was such a good way to end it all. Yeah, you yeah. know. Well, I, that's like the first thing I think was like, I hope. Like, again, curious about the capacity and what, what his role will be, but it's like, I hope it's worth it. Yeah. yeah. I know getting Hugh Jackman and something's always worth it, but character-wise. Yeah. And, like, pop culture-wise. Yeah. Yeah, and, I mean, we'll we'll see. Like, he's 54 now. He was 48 mm-hmm. when this movie came out. Like, you know, how long can he keep up convincingly playing Wolverine in a, in a way that yeah. is satisfying to audiences? Like, I'm annoyed that there were X-Men movies that came after this movie, frankly, uh, because mm-hmm. this would have been such a perfect send off. Like, I, oh, I, yeah, I like you're right. I, I like the X-Men franchise overall. It's a mixed bag of movies when I'm talking about the movie franchise, I should say, not the I, I, I like X-Men, the comics, but like yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the movie franchise is a mixed bag. It's uh, overall better than it is like it, like overall. It's a net positive. Um but the two movies that followed it are just not particularly great. And one of the problems with the franchise as a whole has been that it it was always very Wolverine centric because he was such a popular character. Yeah. And Hugh Jackman was such a, a strong rendition of that character that from the first movie, he basically took over the story and continued all the way through so much so that it feels weird to even be like, well, there's the X-Men movies and then there's the Wolverine movies. Um, but he's the main character in most of them anyway. So it's mm-hmm. kind of all just one massive franchise. And that's... That's why, like, this movie being, like, a story about him with Xavier really feels like, oh, it's the conclusion of what we started with the first X-Men movie. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Because, yeah, if if you just stopped here... um, You lose Apocalypse and you lose Dark Phoenix. Well, actually, Apocalypse came out the year before. Oh, did it? 
Uh, yeah, but you would lose New Mutants and Deadpool 2 and uh, 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 Dark, Dark Phoenix. Phoenix. I, I should also note, I don't, like, Deadpool just also feels like here's a side story anyway, which is right, why I'm right. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, it, it's yeah. barely an X-Men thing. I mean, while right. it is Xavier's mansion and, like, they make X-Men jokes, it's, like, it's its own property. We don't really <laughs> care about the, the rest of the stuff that's been going on. Colossus yeah. is a very different Colossus. Uh, right. You know, it's just, it's it's in the X-Men world, but it's not the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, and it's so meta, it, it, you know, you could literally just have a joke that's like, hey guys, this movie doesn't count. And then you could just do the movie and everyone would be yeah. like, that's funny. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, a world in which I didn't have to watch Age of Apocalypse is a world that I think is a better world personally um as we talked about last week to much chagrin mm-hmm. uh <laughs> and we haven't seen dark phoenix and i haven't all i know is things. that it's i i don't know of anyone that even thinks it's good uh it's better than apocalypse okay oh, that is so the, good to know the, like, okay. I, I will say that uh oh it, that's the, that is relieving <laughs> there it's it's a mixed bag of a movie like there are things that i really like about it but at the end of it all it's like well why did i see this thing yeah. like <laughs> yeah for, versus like apocalypse where i was actively mad <laughs> so yes yes apocalypse i'm still since we recorded that episode last week I've been racking my head trying to think if there is a single superhero movie I like less, and I, I have yet to come up with an answer. Because though the theatrical Justice yeah. League is a worse movie, it's certainly more fun to watch because it's very laughable. Yeah. And that's the only other uh, one that I have as a possibility. Yeah. But maybe that's just a me thing. <laughs> but it sounds like well, it's not. <laughs> I, I, I look forward to hearing your, your thoughts on that one. But I, <laughs> but with this one, like we, we are getting yeah. such a wonderful send off for the character. It feels so final. I mean, it is allowing for more stories because it is set in a future. It's not like it's being set in the present day and Wolverine dies yeah. and spo- spoilers if you're not familiar with Logan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but like you it's, do it's, and listen to this episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But but, you know, it. Because this is the Dark Knight Returns. Like, this is doing mm-hmm. that, like, here's our future yes. story of yes. a character. Um, and it allows this character to be more vulnerable and to get that send off. And to allow, but you can still do the stories before that point because this is just, okay, this is the end. Like, we, right. we have seen this for a lot of characters. I mean, hell, Wolverine had Old Man Logan as a story, which thank God they didn't just like directly adapt uh, when they made this movie. But, like, Comics do this all the time where it's like, oh, this is, by the way, the final story for this character back mm-hmm. to the perpetual act two of the main book. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, and this movie. So so I wanted to talk about the R rating of it all. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I Because I think there's a temptation, especially when you're like a teenager, that it's like, oh, man, if only these movies were R rated, then they'd be good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, you know, we talked about it with Deadpool and this movie, where it it actually does feel, and and by all accounts, the filmmakers in this movie are saying this, where it's like we didn't set out to make an R-rated movie because we wanted to make an edgy movie. Okay, we set out to make it a movie a movie that was had superheroes movie that had superheroes in it, but it is an adult movie, and and it is it has the violence, it has those things, but they're fitting in with the themes that we're trying to say, and the yeah, the okay. stuff we're trying, and and he. Uh, 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 what's his name? Um, oh my gosh, my brain lately on these episodes. Uh, James Mangold mentioned how, like the the scene at the beginning of the movie where Wolverine and Charles are just talking in the in the enclosed enclosure that Charles is basically imprisoned in, mm-hmm. and they're just having like a normal adult conversation. He said, "If we made that movie for." a PG-13 audience, the studios would be freaking out that there's a scene that is going to, like, bore eight-year-olds. Yeah. And so when when you find out that your movie's not a four-quadrant, we have to advertise to everybody, but we only have to advertise to adults, the studios just are okay with those scenes now. Yeah. Scenes that they won't be okay with if it's PG-13. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, and and I think that's that shows even more, like, like, yes, this movie has a lot of violence. It has cussing in it. But it's like it's it's scenes like that that put the movie over the top and mm-hmm. make it extra special. Totally. And those wouldn't be there if it was PG thirteen. Yeah. According mm-hmm. to James Mangold. Yeah. But I think he's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to like constantly be entertaining, quote unquote. Yeah. 
if you're doing PG-13. Yeah, if, that, if that scene's not explaining to us what's going to happen throughout this movie, like exposition dump in some kind of way, yeah. why is it there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it also helped because Hugh Jackman took a pay cut to make sure ensure that this movie wow. gets an R rating. Thank okay. so, God. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it pays off. I mean, everybody loves this movie. It gets nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. I mean, this is like... This is just like the, one of the best uh, superhero movies of all time, and I think it will always be. Yeah. It's just like an mm-hmm. instant classic to me. Um, But yeah, so a, a couple other things. The, the comics that are in the movie, they were only able to use those uh, if... They, they were only t- able to use X-Men comics if they didn't use actual issues, was oh, like right. what okay. Mar- Marvel suggested or, or demanded, I guess, maybe is a better word. Um, but they hired uh, writer Joe Casada and um, oh my goodness, where's the other guy? And Dan Penosian. Is that how you pronounce it? Do you know? I am not sure. Okay. Uh, and he's an artist and they created those so comics. Just curious. And they're like Marvel guys. So they're, yeah. they're in, they were. Yeah, Casada used to be the editor in chief for Marvel. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so see, and he's an artist on top of that, but yeah. I don't. I, I've read one X Men comic to date. I still have not finished. Uh, Days <laughs> you of you got you. Will I know love I do. Them. You it, it's your jam. Not because I don't like it or anything. Yeah, but they're um, your Spider Man. Why why would they not allow real comics? Well, so this was yeah. still in the era of it being a, a Fox property. It, it, they yeah. had not been uh, the sale had not been finalized with Disney. Uh, so oh, it's just as simple as that whole stuff so the licensing is a little bit weird there yeah also i think it actually works better that we're not referencing actual comics because when they sure. do make those kind of comments about how this doesn't sort of live up to the expectations that people have like it's the comics that exist within the world of marvel and marvel mm-hmm. is always allowed for comics to be existing in the world of marvel uh which is just like right. a funny thing about marvel comics in general like uh she hulk as a lawyer has referenced issues of comics in court right. cases, which I think is such a fun kind of detail about it all. Well, like who's it? Um, oh my gosh. What's his name? Pug. He, yeah. he, he will constantly go down to the basement in the comics. Yeah. And they have long it, boxes it, that they'll pull out comics the, to like reference. Yeah. And it's like, well, who is it that you fought in the eighties? She Hulk could like pull it out and oh, read right. the comic and be like, that's the, that's what we need to use to beat him in court. Yeah. And the justification in universe is that there are comics that are based on real events that are occurring. Right. Um, and that's that's just been a thing since the Fantastic Four, like uh, Jack Kirby right, right. and Stan Lee would show <laughs> right. up and they'd have meetings with Reed Richards to talk about recent adventures. And sometimes that would be a setup for explaining how a thing just happened. And they'd be like, cool, we'll go make the new the next issue oh, of Fantastic yeah. Four. So okay. it'd all be very meta, which is a yeah. lot of fun. And so that does allow, though, for a scenario where, OK, we've got then a more comic comic booky version of a comic book event. So like mm-hmm. it, it can already have that filter of like unreality put in there. And mm-hmm. I think that's good in this movie because you can have all right yeah so the events that you read in that comic are real and then the people in this world read like a stripped down or more sensationalized version of that like a you know a tabloid yeah. version of it all mm-hmm. um and i think that's that works in terms of like not insulting the fans yeah sure yeah yeah that's a good point yeah um also i i do want to mention uh uh speaking of jack kirby and stanley uh, one of my one of my favorites because it is so crazy and makes no sense and it's so stupid in all the ways that i love in a good bad stan lee comic uh is in an early issue of fantastic four that they are going to be like totally defeated by dr doom and then it like basically cuts out to stan and kirby and and i think they say something to the effect of like i don't really know how to end it (laughs) <laughs> and and then Doctor Doom visits them, and they like write him out of the issue or something like that. And that's how it is. And that's that's how the Fantastic Four defeat him in that issue. And I'm like, <laughs> that is so crazy. And it, that's it, awesome. It's like so bad, but I I mean that's what I when Stanley is bad, he's still great for me. Yeah. Where yeah. it's like this guy is such a nut. And yeah. it, who knows? Maybe it was Jack Kirby's idea. Uh, he seemed pretty nuts too sometimes. So oh, Jack Kirby's right. a crazy person <laughs> like, in all the best ways but like like uh all, all the stuff with like chariots of fire like oh my god ancient aliens came and taught all of our cultures everything like like wonderful stuff <laughs> well there's so many times when you'll be reading especially fantastic four where like something doesn't make sense and you can tell that by all accounts you know maybe at this time jack kirby and stanley were not 
happy with each other, so they're not talking. And so Stanley's having to explain, like, a guess at what's happening in a panel. <laughs> and it's just so hilarious reading the characters, like, basically figuring out how to write <laughs> the <Yeah>. panel <laughs> within the panel. And that's why the 60s comics are the best. <laughs> <laughs> Again, infamously, the Silver Surfer, Stanley had no idea that that character was going to be in that issue. It was just... They, they discussed Galactus, and then all of a sudden it was just like, oh, yeah, I figured Galactus would have a herald. So, yeah, there's just this character. <laughs> and that I just became, all right, that. Oh, okay, I guess I'll write around this character that you just created. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. Um, but, yeah, so they they did bounce around, uh, including Lee Schreiber in the movie because he was interested in coming back. Okay. Um, I'm glad he's not in it, but I could see him in the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, but I think it, that would be maybe a little too, like... Too many cooks. Too many cooks, and I, I like how um, economical the storytelling mm-hmm. is, and not being like, where were you the past 50 years, or mm-hmm. none yeah. of that. We're just going. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this movie does a really good job of setting up, like, it actually makes you feel like there is a, this long continuity for Wolverine without it being necessary for you to know yeah. all the details. Like, they are, right. they have references to both X-Men Origins and to the Wolverine, like, that you see the samurai sword at one point. Right. Like, there, there's, like, these allusions. It's the same way, um, like, when Jim Lee talks about, like, the yellow costume for Wolverine, the fact that we had, like, little permutations uh, very rapidly between his, his first, second, and third appearances uh, gives you the sense of, like, a longer history for the character than what actually existed um so yeah here it's like oh yeah wolverine's had this uh, like huge career as a as a character in movies and like it's true he had like 17 movies or whatever like there's this just massive number of appearances of a character um but the but we're not requiring anyone to really know about it all like the villain Mm -hmm. of the or not the villain of the movie the 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 monster being controlled by the villain of the movie is just a clone of the of the main character and it works yeah. really well and it and it has thematic resonance in the same way that like the thing that he's saving is like his daughter mm-hmm. through the same sort of it's all part of the this whole process and it has this like family kind of dynamic to it that you would lose if if Lee Schreiber or Sabretooth showed up again because Definitely. it would be yeah. Oh, like for one thing, he would be the same character as X twenty four. Like in terms of like, well, what is he doing? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Unless he was the clone of it. But, uh, oh, and you could get into like, oh, well, I guess the adamantium is poisoning Wolverine, but not Sabretooth because Sabretooth doesn't have adamantium. So that, hey, look, look, yeah, he's better right. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this but, opens up a lot of questions now that you mention it. Yeah, but you would need that movie to like that movie would have have had to have a long history of encounters with Sabretooth that we don't actually get in the movies. Like the comics could True. have done that, but yeah. like we you know, we had uh Tyler Main in the first movie playing Sabretooth, then Lee Schreiber and X-Men Origins Wolverine, and it just isn't that continuity continuity of like this arch rival who has been hounding him all his life. Like it's right. all, it's right. two appearances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I I do think that the clone uh Wolverine has a Lee Schreiber look from Origins. Um, he kind of does. Yeah, that, you pointed that out. And I, I don't know if that was intentional or not. Maybe just it, it also, no matter what, he looked like an older version. I mean, he does look older because he is, he looks stronger and healthier you younger? and younger. Um, but he, he had like a saber tooth feel to him. And maybe it was the rage had something to do with it too. I know Wolverine has rage, yeah. but um, it almost feels like we, we can't, we can't bring saber tooth into this, but we'll have, characteristics that might remind you of that yeah i mean maybe maybe that's who it would have been in the movie i i'm curious i and i don't know how early on they scrapped yeah. this they probably didn't even have the finish they, they probably were just like just to see if he was interested at all Steve schreiber just probably called and was like hey i would do this again and they're like yeah we'll think about it yeah. and then the next week they're <laughs> like nah we're not gonna do that yeah <laughs> but uh yeah and and other than that i mean the I, I had never heard this, but Mangold had started working on throwing around an idea for a Laura movie. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Um, but fo- when with the Fox acquisition, um, all oh. the X-Men movies have been stalled. Yeah. Um, and he has since said, like, I really don't think that's happening. Okay. Um, so we're just waiting on Marvel to make X-Men again. Uh, <laughs> and we keep waiting and keep waiting. Um, but yeah, so that is... That's that's basically the notes I have on the movie. Do you got any actors that we should hit? Yeah. Hold on. My phone's not loading anymore. Give me a second. Um, <sighs> now I got to edit. I mean, there's now so we... many good ones on here. <laughs> like, first first actor, we should just obviously talk about Hugh Jackman, both playing old Wolverine and also then 
X twenty four. Who is who is a nod to like a, a nod to Albert, which was the robot Wolverine from the comics, as well as like you could argue that there's some like elements of Dokken, his uh, his bastard son. Uh, um, oh, okay. Going on. I'm not with familiar him. with either of these. Yeah, I mean Albert's kind of like lost. Uh, popularity in the books uh, especially because okay. there's so many wolverines now in the comics like literally <laughs> yeah. there's there, there there was a recent arc where it was like wolverine and his whole family and that it's like five of them just running around doing stuff so uh <laughs> there, there's just a lot of wolverines but um like it, it was fun having that juxtaposition to show like okay here is how terrifying like wolverine would be if he didn't have that compassion you know like so mm-hmm. much of this movie is about like the amount of weight that Wolverine feels at this point in his life, having killed mm-hmm. so many people. Like when, when Laura says like, Oh, I've only killed bad people. And it's like, it's still going to weigh on you. Like, mm-hmm. and it's yeah. such like, those are such wonderful moments with Hugh Jackman sort of expressing that. And then to see what it's like, if you completely strip that humanity away, if you get the weapon that they tried to create with weapon X and instead you get this thing that this, like, like this killer who has Logan's face and like, is doing terrible things in his name. So he's, so Logan is then additionally like burdened by the pain of this. Like when he picks up professor X and he's like whispering, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It's like, Mm -hmm. you're, you're seeing all of this like pain that this character has gone through. And it's such a wonderful performance by Hugh Jackman, like being like, I have done the worst things and I can't Mm -hmm. sleep without thinking about all the faces of the people I've killed. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just a fantastic performance. Uh, And the fact that we, used modern t- filmmaking technology like the modern deep fake stuff to like really sell this sort of like younger version of mm-hmm. yourself combat which movies have tried to do for a long time and it's never really worked out that well yeah oh yeah it looks pretty fantastic in this yeah yeah there there were some other uh, 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 just to mention and and the movie's great but there was some weird and it, it's probably the 97 million dollar budget. I think they used most of that on on the uh the effects with them fighting because there were some weird effects throughout this movie. I, I noticed where I was like, "Oh, I don't remember I don't remember a lot a lot of this these parts just looking strange and kind of fakey." I but, think you noticed it more than I did. Yeah. A lot of but a lot of that. the car shots and then and then Yeah. Everything, and I mean cars where it's like driving, and then everything where they were within the car, it was like, wow, they they just have not figured out the green screen when you're driving cars. They still haven't. Yeah, <laughs> there there are very few movies, even today, that that it it looks like people are actually driving, and yeah. I wonder if those movies are ones where they actually are. Right. And they just have the trailer hitch up that they use for the carpool karaoke. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know that's that's fine. I just am mentioning it because. We're diving deep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Laura is played by Daphne Keane. Um, she's also in His Dark Materials and Anna. And so several, well, not a ton of other things, but this other one. Well, this is um, her introducing. She gets the introducing title card on this. So Yeah. And it looks like she's going to be in an upcoming uh, Star Wars series, The Acolyte. Okay. That I've not heard of. Um, and then Boyd Holbrook plays Pierce. Um the the guy with the mechanical mechanical hand. I um, really liked him. I thought they did so a good, good <laughs> job of setting up a very smart character. Yeah, uh, yeah. Re- rewatching it and noticing how afraid he was of Laura, I thought was really yeah. good. Like the like, it makes you wonder like how he lost that hand. Um, right. Which the hand oh, design, sure. I freaking loved. The fact that the fingers could go in the opposite direction yeah. was such yeah, a cool detail. Cool. Like this movie has so many good little details, uh, and that was one of them. Um, He's also great in terms of setting up the dystopia of the world and has like such yes. good delivery of it all. Like when he's talking about Freddy Krueger and a tiger and it's like one's mm-hmm. fictional and one is extinct. You're like, oh, yeah. man, that's the time we're in right now. Like, I, yeah, just, I love so those good. tiny little world building things. Yeah. We don't need to see it. It's just this is where we are. This is what's yeah. happening. You know, this movie, oddly enough, kind of reminds me of Looper. Yeah, uh, because that movie has a lot of those subtle subtle things that are like oh it's in the future and it's not that far away and they're not explaining it Mm -hmm. but there are some weird little things like like the self like like in looper i I, it always sticks with me that all the cars have like it looks like a tube that goes from their exhaust into their gas can and it's like oh they figured out a way to like reuse their own gas so there's probably like less gas in this world and just little details like that and i know in this movie they mentioned something about corn Mm -hmm. um I don't act. I didn't catch it. 
uh, but it, it sounded dystopian. <laughs> yeah, there's. Well, I, it sounds like I, I want to go in a big tear on the dystopian stuff, but let's work through actors oh, okay. first because the the dystopian future of this movie I think is fantastic, and I I want to spend some time talking about it. Okay, okay, cool. yeah, yeah, let's not waste it all right now. Wait, wait, uh, Boyd Holbrook, though, I it, it's crazy because he's in Sandman. Um, yeah, and the that, Corinthian. He's the Corinthian in Sandman, and. That really felt like this is the first time I've ever seen this actor. <laughs> I thought he was fantastic in that. And since watching Sandman, there have been so many things we've watched, like rewatch. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, hey, it's there like, he is oh. again. <laughs> so we've been really familiar with this person for a while. And yeah. this was what watching Logan, it was like, oh my gosh, we get him? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, he's also in The Host, um, The Predator, vengeance um the premise and i a million other things those are just a few notable things um and then steven merchant plays caliban um as a lot of people know one of the creators of the uk office um he's also uh he, he's done a lot of acting but he's also done a lot of producing um he's a producer of extras um he's also in jojo rabbit uh, he's in four lives the outlaws and a ton of other stuff. But before you move on, because I'm sure you didn't clock this, because I didn't clock this. Okay. Uh, well, that doesn't mean you didn't, but I just doubt it. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> that sounds even worse. <laughs> I'm digging myself into a hole here. Just uh, say what you're going to say. <laughs> um, this character was in Apocalypse. Yes. Um, his name is Caliban, and he's the one that Mystique goes to to help her give, like, the passports to mutants, and he's tracking mutants That's in that Caliban? movie. Caliban? Yep. Yeah. Oh, I don't remember a name being said for that character. Yeah, well, I think he refers to himself in the third person, and uh, oh, I, then I'm wrong. So I, I think because okay. I remember him saying the name Caliban a bunch. Yeah. Uh, and and not I didn't put together that it was the same because I don't think I've read a comic with Caliban in it. Oh. So I didn't tr I didn't clock any of this stuff. Um, in that movie, was there any use of his? Mutant powers? I think he was using it to help track down mutants he and was? stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that, that makes sense why she would go to him. Duh. Yeah, and, and oh, we okay. find out in this movie that he has helped track them down to hunt them. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's so yeah. like I mean, in between Apocalypse and now. Like, like, this is such a different interpretation of the character. And like, he, he comes off as so, like essentially an original thing for this movie. Like, you know, like they're not expecting audiences to be familiar with him. Um, mm. And there's such good shorthand to establish like the things that we care about. The fact that he burns in the sunlight, the fact that he's uh, got this dark past of being forced to hunt mutants and being used as like a, a dog yeah. effectively. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, it, like it does a really good job of selling this character and making him very compelling. Uh, he's a bit smarter here than he is in the comics. Um, oh, okay. And, oh, okay. Interesting. Um, and it, it's like, so the character started off as like a Morlock, like one of the the mutants that like live in the sewers because they are like kind of freaks uh, that oh. okay. people re have rejected. And so he's sort of like their version of Cerebro to like find mutants and bring yes. into their community. Right. Um, and like there was a version in the 90s where he had been uh, tortured by Apocalypse and like made like big and buff. And he was like on the on X-Force. Um, but uh, I think was like more childlike at the time. Like, like Caliban's always just seemed like at, either developmentally disabled or at the very least, like um, uneducated. And so has like mm. usually been like kind of like in a weird space here. So like this version where he's so smart and he's got that Stephen Merchanty kind of like wit mm -hmm. is, is fairly new. Um, and then he's been oh, used okay. more recently in the comics and uh, in a bit, bit more of a positive light. So it, it's fun to see it. Um, he's, he's notorious as like the, the, the character who has mutant tracking powers specifically. Um, and I think they do a really good job of introducing him here and making it sort of plausible that he'd be around and like, what, like, why is he here? And then he's a MacGuffin for yeah. later stuff. And that's really good. Yeah. And like, it, just a really interesting character. And you, you feel this like terrible life that they're all living together. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, Elizabeth Rodriguez plays Gabriella. Um, she is also in Miami Vice, Orange is, no, oh, not Orange is the New Black. Yes, Orange is the New Black, The Drop. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then Richard E. Grant plays Dr. Rice. Did not remember him being in this movie either. Oh, I did not remember him either, um, yeah. He is Can You Ever Forgive Me? He is so good in that movie. So good. Um, Gosford Park, Hudson Hawk with Nail and I, millions of other things. <laughs> And then just briefly to go over the the family that they stay with. So Eric LaSalle plays Will Munson. Um, he is in ER, um, Coming to America, 
coming to America or coming coming to America? To America. Okay. Um, one hour photo, a second chance at love, Andrew Trebekah, and then Elise Neal plays Catherine Munson. Um, she is in. Oh, she's in Scream Two. Oh, I thought she. She looked familiar. Who is she in Scream 2? She's the, um, she is in the theater with her boyfriend, I think. Oh. I think. Fake. No, it isn't, that's Jada Pickens Smith at the opening of the movie. You're right, you're right. Yeah. No, but it's her friend then, because she's yeah. her friend. Yeah, yeah. That, that's who I thought you were saying. Yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah. that's cool. Okay. So, yeah, she's in Scream 2. She's in Hustle and Flow, Money Talks, Angel, and then Quincy Faust played is played by Nate Munson or Quincy Faust plays Nate Munson. Um, he is in Casey Undercover, um, <laughs> which is the Zendaya Disney thing. Um, I Legacies, have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. uh, Legacies, Bosch, um, and several other things like the Goldberg and other TV shows. Okay, as well. yeah, he's the son, so he's a younger actor, so not not as much mm. big stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, we haven't talked about Patrick Stewart. Yeah, we, we. I mean, we talked about him a long time ago, but it's it's time to revisit because yeah. this is the last we'll talk about him. I think. So I have a thesis about we'll Patrick Stewart as Professor X, which is that okay. I think that Patrick Stewart is so good in the role and has so much charm and warmth coming off of him in this particular part. And just in general, as a public figure that he has made yeah. professor X infinitely more likable than he is supposed to be. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Uh, <laughs> when, when I went to, cause I, I was reading the Claremont issues, but after I'd seen the movies and I was like, Oh, I didn't realize he's like kind of a jerk. Yeah. Like I just didn't even know that. Uh, and so when you read the comics, it's kind of, Weird. I don't know. Is he like that still? Or have, oh, even they, worse. have like, they changed him? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, no, he, he's even more of a of a jerk. Like he like the thing is, for, first of all, when X-Men first started, he wasn't supposed to be that old. Like he's only supposed to be like 30 in the first yeah. issue of X-Men. Um because they're all teenagers. They're like all 16 and mm -hmm. 17, and he's the he is their headmaster at this school. Um or the only teacher at this school in quotes <laughs> um and, and he's like just get he, it out jack just like, get it out give he, me the script and let's has, get this comic out he has feelings for gene gray like he is like is ableist as all hell because he like regrets the fact that he was injured and put in a wheelchair like he was a jock before he got injured um so like there's this whole vibe of him like missing out on his athleticism oh, like yeah. his it's his brain allows him to escape in the comics but it's actually he like really wants to be a physical entity like when he when he has his legs restored he wants to be out there in the world like actively participating in things he doesn't want to sit behind and only connect to people mentally um and I think that Patrick Stewart, amazing casting that he is, makes him feel like everyone's dad and makes him feel like someone who mm -hmm. is so warm and comforting and, and kind and not likely to, you know, just mess with people's brains on a whim because he can, because all the telepaths at, at, in the X-Men books are like a little creepy in terms of what they've done with their powers. Like, <laughs> like Jean Grey is not that great of a person. She has outed people as gay against their will uh, just because, you know. She can. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> like that's that's a thing that like is is in the Marvel stuff, and like and, and like Professor X now is like like yeah, he's got a big dream and he's like got good ideas, but he also is very okay with uh, sacrificing people along the way and like doing some not some some shady stuff in order to make it happen. Um, and again, Patrick Stewart just sort of makes you forget about those things. He's just yeah. He's just wonderful. And this movie is such a great, first of all, it's such a great like exploration of like just an older man, you know, like yeah. when this movie came out. Um, so what, uh, I, I moved back to the DC area in, in 2014 or 2015 to take care of my grandfather. And at the time I was still in that phase. So like there was a lot of stuff that really hit home when yeah. this movie came sure. out because yeah. I was actively doing that where it's like, okay, yep, I'm going to change your depends right now. And I'm going to deal with all of like all of these things that are, are like Wolverine is going through. And like, that is a relationship I, we don't talk as much about in media. Like the, mm -hmm. the, no. the son dealing with the elderly parent or father or just the child dealing with the elderly parent. I shouldn't like gender it. Like it's, 
you know, like being that caregiver for that older person. And I, w- I wish that uh, my another past co-host, Sam, could have been on this call right now because she's actively dealing with that. Um, like she is the sole caregiver for her grandfather um, and is uh, going through that same situation where mm-hmm. like it's it's really wild to like have that dynamic. Like the person who used to take care of you, you're now the person taking care of them in very much the same kind of way. Like mm-hmm. where. Yeah where there are moments that are like infantilizing for them. Like that happens as you get older, like you just lose the ability to be this assertive, powerful figure. And especially with someone who's like paralyzed, like that's going to be even more so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That, that was when I saw it. And even, even on this viewing, the, the, all of the Charles Xavier stuff actually for me, I think is what is the most unique thing about this movie. Mm-hmm. personally mm-hmm. where where i just feel like again like you're saying this relationship is not explored that often in in film and um it, it's also the idea that he has i think they i don't know if they put a label on it but he's having these seizures and and the the idea of someone who has all of this great power which is also what wolverine is dealing with you have all this great power but now you can't use it like you could in youth mm-hmm. and it's out of control mm-hmm. um i was just like that is infinitely more interesting than the the last you know three x-men movies or whatever well, like, not only that he just has that. to he has to medicate himself so to that like kind of takes away those powers a little bit the potency because yeah, they become right. harmful to people in a way he can't control. But he's so, so he unfocused is, when that, yeah. like that, the medication prevents him, makes his mind so cloudy right. that he's e- like, he's like, he clearly doesn't have the clarity of thought that he can right. even have at this act of time. So it's even more infantilizing. Like in order mm-hmm. to be safe, he has to like strip himself of, of his very, of his brain. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a lot. Like it's an incredible yeah. performance in that regard. Uh, mm-hmm. Other other personal anecdote for why this movie really hit hard. Uh, like at the time, also when this movie came out, my dog had epilepsy, and like that was a, a oh, common man. thing that we were dealing with as well. Which was that like mm-hmm. yeah, she would just have seizures in the night, and like so like I had two of these things going on, and then they're both articulated here with Professor X. Jeez, yeah. I know. <laughs> You're just I know. It's like they're <laughs> weeping. <laughs> Well, and and like that meant a lot. Like my wife really liked this when we watched the movie then and then rewatching this now. Like I was surprised because she often zones out of the stuff that I'm watching for podcasts because, you know, like while she she enjoys the superhero movies enough to go see them, she doesn't really care to watch them multiple times. And Mm -hmm. like this is one where it's like, oh, all of these things were stuff that we were directly dealing with, like in our life when this movie came out and like have such like tangible feelings about. Yeah, Yeah. man, I I know that. Yeah, because I, for me in movies, anything with parent stuff always gets me. And I, as I've said before on the podcast, it's not because I have, have a bad relationship with my parents. I think it's because I have a great relationship with my parents. These things feel harder. Yeah. And now the last couple of things we've watched that include parent stuff and us about to have a kid, it's like yeah, it hits yeah. even harder <laughs> too. That, that, so like, especially just by the end of this movie where she is calling him daddy. Oh my stuff. gosh. Like as oh he's my gosh. Dying. Just st- stuff like that. It's just hitting in a way that it never could. Well, and we're going to name our baby X23. So, <laughs> <Right>. you know. <laughs> so that really hit hard because I, I forgot. About, no. <laughs> um, okay, everybody. We're coming in for another ad about our audiobook, but we're going faster. We wanted to give you the first intro that last time, but now it's fast. The fact that you have to explain that this one's going to be faster is already <laughs> it's not already hurting the chances. Fast. But we're not slowing down. Okay. Shut it. Our podcast, the Macad Podcast Universe, is now going to be available as audiobooks starting on April 25th. Uh, several collections will be coming out that will include um, all of the Marvel phases that we have covered and more. And then we have more coming out on May 9th and then more coming out on June 6th. Um, and it's, several of these collections will have exclusive bonus content that you can only get in the audiobooks. Yeah. And some of them also include the Patreon episodes that made sense to include as well. And so, you can get these wherever you get your wherever. audiobooks. And you can go to the library and you can request that they get it. And that means you can get it on like Barnes and Noble. Apple, Google Play, Downpour, Digital, Physical, probably whatever. Hoopla, maybe. Yeah, it's all over the place. Check it out. We love you guys. Out. No, yeah. The, the something that really stuck out to me on this viewing is how this movie is about fatherhood. 
mm-hmm. and and it's different stages mm-hmm. where it's like the dying father, then the son that is taking care of the father, and then the father who is trying to like be a dad when he wasn't there and that's not his fault in this movie but it is dealing with those issues of like you were not there dad yeah yeah um i mean he didn't know about it so yeah. it's, it's not yeah. like a indictment of his character um but that it's kind of nice in that way because most movies you know when they are dealing with you know the the absent father as a viewer a lot of times it's hard to be empathetic to the father because you're like, you made that decision, Mm -hmm. you know? And in this, he didn't. So you're just like, I want you to be able to connect with this girl. Mm -hmm. And and you don't, you don't have that extra layer that you're trying to get over the whole movie Mm -hmm. because he, 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 in a way he's, he's just trying to do like, he doesn't necessarily owe it to this thing that was created in a lab. Well, he clearly just cares about Charles. Yeah. Even until after he dies. And it's time, and she's trying to get him to still take her where she would like to go, and he's like still refusing, yeah, because he was really only doing it for Charles. And then she convinces <sighs> yeah. him, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Um, well, let's let's start digging in here to the plot. Yeah. I mean, we've already talked about a lot of the goodness here, but I love, and I had completely forgotten about this opening scene where he is just ambushed by these guys trying to take his hubcaps mm-hmm. or tires or whatever. And, and it's kind of just a, it, it's a very fascinating and great, I, I love analyzing the first scenes in movies, especially when you have leading up to this, okay, it's going to be the last Wolverine movie, and guess what, guys? It's rated R. And so I, I think sometimes the rated R gets hit so hard. You know, rated R is something people always talk about, especially mm-hmm. with superhero movies. It's like, I wish it was rated R. I wish it was rated R. And, um... I, I love how this movie totally upends your expectations where you're like, this is going to be so awesome. And then he is like beaten senseless for a second. The title card shows up while he is like n- nearly unconscious on the ground, <laughs> like basically stating their intent of creating this movie. <laughs> and then you do get the cool action scene, but it doesn't have the catharsis of him Yeah. in, in the other movies. Yeah. There's, yeah. Th- um, so I was tweeting about this and I, I used a phrase that I ended up rather liking, which was that this movie deals with the tragedy of violence. Like yes. every time there is a fight, it is a regrettable thing that happens like mm-hmm. uh, that. And and I think that that like I don't want an R rated X-Men movie, I but I do yeah. want an R rated Wolverine movie because we're dealing mm-hmm. with specifically this character and we're studying what the impact of this kind of behavior is on this one particular character uh, and we're being forced to live with it like, like you said it's not cathartic like there's no point where the violence I mean the, there's a little bit of it in the in the third act where you're like oh fuck yeah, yeah okay yeah. cool uh, yeah. <laughs> but, right. but it is always regrettable at, at, at the end of it all like the fact the fact that we even got to that position is, is a bad situation. Um, mm-hmm. and, and like this opening sequence is, does such a great job of like, yep, he's trying not to. And then like the, the claws pop out and then almost with almost by accident, all of these really bad things happen in that fight. You know, like right. it's impossible yeah. to have knives for hands and not horribly maim people in a fight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've seen yeah. Edward Scissorhands. we've seen what happens but yeah yeah that's true yeah and the the and even just the the details right off the bat like his one of his claws doesn't come out all the way Mm -hmm. and he looks at it and it's just like like i gotta deal with this now Mm -hmm. i gotta like get get these guys out of here kill them all and then i i gotta go home and like rip this claw out all the way because it's stuck he's like got mm-hmm. arthritis or something like and, that and we don't know why he's pulled over on the side of the road sleeping we do yeah. find out that the car is a lease and it is just like what is happening what what <laughs> yeah. situation and position is he in right now mm-hmm. Well, I mean that alone where you are this ultra powerful being which is what all these characters in this movie are they're ultra powerful beings and they are like kind of at the lowest low i mean he's i mean not not to say that like be, driving a limo is a low thing to do i'm not saying that at all no, but, but he's a gig because, economy yeah. worker it's like a version of yeah. uber specifically yeah. for yeah. him 
and it's like in this like hedonistic scenario like th- he's in texas and it's like all these like bachelorette parties and like drunk right. people he's like chauffeuring around like people who are at their most decadent and like there's like like that one group of like frat yeah. boys all going usa usa and they're yeah. taunting them. <laughs> right. like i i think they might be in mexico at that point like they're, uh, yeah you i know, think so too it, it's just all this like really kind of gross um behavior that he's seeing people at their worst and he is like scraping by a living in this you know like again like at at, at his lowest like he's lived this long life and now uh, he's just just some guy that's getting hired to like drive a car yeah and, right. and in a way i think witnessing the world that he saved more than once like like yeah. seeing, seeing people in, in these it's like i did all this for this yeah, like i yeah. saved all these people to 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 do this like yeah and, and i we can get into the dystopian stuff at any point but like it, it is like a near future thing and it we don't see a ton of it in a in a good way we we mostly just see like it's there's he lives in a desert it doesn't look like their situation's great and then they go to a casino which isn't always the most fun place to be yeah too. so and then we we do get like a, a good moment of this like they get to stay with this really hospitable family yeah but there, there's not a lot of like it looks like nurturing going on in this world mm-hmm. for the most part no yeah yeah and we're we're in the year 2029 mm-hmm and uh, if anyone has the time who's a listener, I would love a list of uh, future movies that aren't that far away. Because oh. I, I like this genre. Because, again, I'm bringing up Looper. Like, it, it just didn't seem that far away. And, Did they and ever I, say it in that movie? I don't know. I, I mean, they Looper. are like, hey, time travel's been invented, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Um, but, but, of course, sure it's been invented in the future. sets and, the time because then they have to set up how far in the future. You're right. So, yeah. Somewhere in it. Like Looper's yeah. already the future, and then there's like an even further future in Looper. Yes. I, what what I love about this this future is that it is so tangible. Like they do mm, such yes. a good job. This might be as good a time as any to s- explain. Let's do Explain it. the Let's setting on it. this one. So, <laughs> I I love all of this. Like man, the world sucks, and this is how it's going to keep sliding into suck even harder if you give it 15 more years, like mm-hmm. it, it's all stuff that you can see coming. Like the, the fact that we have automated uh, like freight trucks uh, running mm-hmm. on the street and like all the yeah. potential problems for that, the, the, the situation we already see with like big industrial agriculture and how it's gone even larger and how secretly it's messing with us with chemicals. Like it, yes. it's already there. Like, and we're just like letting it become even more like, monolithic like the machines that they walk through in the, these vast cornfields are so terrifying and huge you know mm-hmm. it, it's all these things that we like have integrated into our life uh for convenience has become a voluntary dystopia that we have like ex- like put ourselves in and it has stripped mm-hmm. the world of yeah. wonder by virtue of stripping the world of, of mutant kind you know yeah but also just animal life like we know like there are still animals out there but but it's not the, the really exotic and, and amazing ones are gone. Like the, mm-hmm. the tigers are gone. The, like the things mm-hmm. that we couldn't control that were like part of a world that mankind wasn't meant to touch. Uh, we've destroyed in making everything this commoditized, like commercial hellscape. You know, it is exactly the, the thing that capitalism is going to build towards. And it is <laughs> yeah. great that we have a movie that's like really showing off just how bad that will be. Mm-hmm. And just a refresher. So... <laughs> Mutant. Okay, can someone just condense like the mutant situation in this world? So, uh, yeah, like in this world specifically, or in in this one specifically in this movie. Yeah. So, yeah. like, no new mutants had been born uh, for twenty five years at the point where we get to this movie, okay. and so the okay. the understanding is that in order to respond to this growing population of mutants, which are you know, humans that have some sort of X factor in their DNA that has been activated by external stimuli, either from uh, radiation that's ambient in the world or just um, conditional stimuli that would would force it upon a person. Um, hum- like, basically, the government has seeped into all of our crops and all of, like, the high fructose corn sh- syrup and all the stuff that's out there. They have found a way to like put an agent that suppresses that that tendency towards. Got it, got it, got it. Oh, uh, see, I missed that. Yes. Yeah, so is that's that what, when they're walking through the cornfield? Is that when they describe that? Well, that sets up that there's stuff going on with the corn, and then the doctor um, 
Yeah, what does he say? Uh, Dr. Rice explains that the they wanted to eliminate the random factor, which is mutants just sort of popping up out of nowhere. Um, and they wanted to be in control of it so that they introduced an element in, in the supply uh, that would prevent babies from being born with mutant yeah. powers. Um, oh. And isn't what, his whole thing, because I think he has, I, I like how he delivers it. I think he's talking to Caliban about it where he's like, I'm not against it. I, I, but I just want to be able to control, control it. it. Right. Yeah. It's kind of his thing. Yeah. He wants to t- take those cer- those samples and be able to breed them on command as opposed to right. having just like random people be born. Because how terrifying is Magneto as a concept of like, oh, here's an underclass person that we were trying to torture, but also he has the powers of a god and he just can show yeah. up. <laughs> right. You know? Right. So th- this is an element of being like, we don't want we don't want someone who has these powers that we're not paying to exist. Uh, totally. They keep talking yeah. about like people who have patents. Um, and, and so like, there's this idea of like, all right, well, they can start cloning, they can start creating on command, a soldier mm-hmm. of this type, uh, and it will be useful in this way. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. And there, I, I was always left wondering, like, is this a factor in why Wolverine's healing factor is getting weaker? Um, that there is a mutant suppressing chemical that is being oh, that's int- interesting. introduced into all the food. The movie doesn't explicitly come down either way about it. I, I think no. it is completely fine to say like, oh, it just stopped other mutants from being born and Wolverine's just getting old. Plus he's got poison in his body and that's causing mm-hmm. his him not to be able to handle it any after a long enough period of time. Um, mm-hmm. Or you could say like it's probably causing his mutant factor to be a little bit weaker and it's making it worse. I think either way works fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because e- either way, they're dealing with a thing from the comics, which is that adamant, like having metal attached to your bones is going to poison your blood over time. And the only reason Wolverine right. hasn't died at this point is he has a healing factor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. OK. Wow, man. That, see, this is why I feel like I feel like a lot of times in some of our other superhero movies we've covered, we'll, we'll come across something so complicated like this. Like, where are the mutants at? And mm-hmm. they're using corn to suppress and all this other stuff. And it's always like, yeah, not not always, but a lot of times it's just kind of like, yeah, I, I don't really care. They spend too much time on that in the movie. Like, get get to <laughs> it. But there's something about the X-Men movies, and, and, I, and maybe it's simply the fact that they are just an allegory for the outsider in real life. Mm-hmm. It's always interesting what is going on in those little details. When I love, and th- I think this movie does such a great job. They do, there is obviously ex- exposition for why things are, but there's also just, they explain things, but then they just allow the implications for you yes. to think of them. Yes. That you'll just start thinking like, oh, so that's why this person's this way or circumstances are this way is because of the implications of that one thing. That's yep, what I yep. think is so great. Yeah, you're about right. It. Yeah, so they, they don't they, get to, they don't get bogged down in the details. Yeah, they tease yeah. a lot of ideas early so that you're primed for it yes. for when the exp- when the actual explanation happens, when that exposition occurs. Yeah. You're like, "Okay, cool. That explains the thing that I was already told about." Like, "Oh, no mutants yes. been born for 25 years." Just so happens that we introduced a chemical to stop mutants from being born 25 years ago. "Oh, that's why." Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um but yeah, okay, so um and oh and i also want to note 2029 is coming up pretty quick um and some of these ideas feel you know i know there's no mutants out well actually who knows uh but you know this movie doesn't doesn't feel that dystopian compared to right now (laughs) right well and like i said it's doing such a wonderful job of having things that are so close and then Mm -hmm. just taken a little bit further without it being so much further like there there are no big leaps that are completely impossible um like the way the the forms of entertainment people watch are about the same the way people interact with the world using their cell phones and having like Mm -hmm. app like an app driven kind of focus is about the same the self-driving cars is really the biggest leap and that's Mm -hmm. honestly one freight like automated freight is going to be the thing that gets pushed the hardest because that that is the backbone of the economy that people don't really focus on but mm-hmm. is the thing that like we we know that Amazon was trying to do it with drones already like we we mm-hmm. know that that is going to be the most commercially viable component and it is going to be the thing that you can uh, like segment off in a way that will work best like self-driving cars in a city are going to be very difficult to get right mm-hmm. because you've got lots of cars you've got lots of variables yeah a truck on a highway that is under remote control is going to be a lot easier to run uh, so right. th- that's going to happen before we get to the point where like all of our vehicles are self-driven or controlled by computer. Like there's also, I don't even know if the, those trucks are completely self-driven or remote. So 
Yeah. Because they, they could be drone controlled and it's like, oh, there's like one guy with like 17 different trucks that he's just making sure that they don't crash into anything. Yeah. Dang. Yeah, it would make sense to do that. I don't know. This movie makes me feel like they shouldn't, but it does seem oh, it's, like uh, a kind of a good idea. <laughs> all, all these are things that are probably bad. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but if, 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 if I've been taught one thing, it's it's giving things intelligence that shouldn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we see that it's it's possible to game it. Like those trucks start going out of control because it's part of the fear tactic that, that they're doing on the, what is the Munson family? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because um, they're trying to drive them out. Right. And so they're trying their to land is valuable. Yeah. So by like sabotaging the trucks to like, like ram into them on the road, like it's mm-hmm. all part of this like, like whole effort of like, well, we, we sabotage this thing and this thing and uh, oh, they just died. Ah, like, and then finally, because, right. because of Wolverine's intervention, like they didn't die the first time they didn't die the second time. And then they like come with armed people. Uh, and yeah. Oh, see, I don't think I even clocked that that the that the freight would be an intentional act did you clock that no i don't think so but, it but that's a like pretty sense. good i like that like the because the, the freight yeah. has like um they're, they're indicate like there's like indicator lights when like thing the like commands are going through it um it it yes, looks like right. it's intentional it, it looks like it's the but it, yeah. lights, but it's yeah. going after the munsons it's not going after wolverine yes. and we're with we're with logan laura and xavier at that point so they yeah. they're just caught up in someone else's strife Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that, and that, and w- we will fill in the gaps, folks, here. But now that we're there, <laughs> I just love, I love freaking Patrick Stewart and his delivery where, where Logan, Logan says, someone will come by and help him. We need to keep moving. And he goes, someone already has. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, come on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's something you can take to the bank with you. When you see <laughs> someone in need, you're probably the person that needs to be there, mm-hmm. which is sometimes hard to do. Yep. But actually, almost all the time it is. But, but in a in a cool way too. Like in that part of the movie, it's like we are the superheroes. We do save yeah. the day. Yeah, I know none of it's never been like explicit or anything. But it's like, yeah, we're here. This is what we were. Was what that's kind of like his thing has always been to help others. Yeah, you know. So yeah. Um, but let so let's go back. Speaking of him. Um, and, and go to like the little X compound, <laughs> the, the new Westchester. <laughs> yeah. So Wolverine has been like making money as this like limo driver to try to save mm-hmm. up money to both buy medicine. And we see him like having to like bribe people to get like anti Caesar medication uh, to, right. to take to Xavier, who is alive. But they keep in this like old water tower uh, so that he doesn't radiate psychic thoughts and kill people and they hint at like that was a thing that happened a while ago yeah yes yeah is that at that point in the movie later on when he's in bed and he's like i did something really bad i know that i did but i can't remember what i did right is he yeah. alluding to a situation of that yeah, yeah. They, they, that's just what i think they, they yeah. reference um when after the uh, the casino incident. They the the news is talking yes. about the Westchester incident. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and right. they they say that it actually resulted in the death of most of the X Men. Um, so we are being shown again. They prime these situations very early in the movie. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that w- when we get like the little bits of exposition later, we can like connect the dots. Um, it it does a really good job of setting up. Okay, yes. So Xavier, when he has a seizure, it's bad. Caliban says, "I couldn't breathe for a full minute because mm-hmm. of that whole situation," and that it doesn't affect you yeah. the way it does everyone else, which is also great because it then sets up a f- amazing action scene. Sorry, can I swear? Yes. I, I I don't know if I. Yes. Ever oh okay. yeah, you're good. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, is this our rating? <laughs> like they they set up so much in that that whole thing about like, okay, Xavier's on this medicine. It makes you really loopy. I can say. My dog was a very, very confused girl when she was on her medicine. So, like, I yeah. it, like understand that part also making sense. And they set up, okay, well, Xavier, when he's on all this medicine, is is not, which means that when he's thinking clearly, you you have to wonder what's going on. <laughs> um, right. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 th- yeah, the idea that that Wolverine is is constantly like so. I guess the implication is that this psychic event is is so powerful that it is like deteriorating minds, and Wolverine is like constantly regenerating his mind while this is happening. Is nuts so but so. Yeah. Um. And and it's cool because it's like a, you know, in the in the previous movies he can freeze people, mm-hmm. and so it's like he's doing a version of that, but he's not doing it correctly or something because people are like still 
pretty aware. Yeah. And they're mm. in pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's it's also I mean, that that's what's cool is and, and that's what I meant when I said earlier, like this movie is not afraid of its own source material. It's not afraid of its own like in universe film source material. It's okay with referencing it. Um, it's not trying to like totally reject it. Mm -hmm. It's accepting it and then building upon it and doing new things we haven't seen with it. Yes. Right. And that's that's part of why this movie's so good. Right. Um, yeah. And so Wolverine wants to buy a boat to take Xavier out onto the sea. So he's as far away from people as possible. Like he, right. yeah. And he wants Xavier to live out the rest of his life. And then as soon as Xavier dies, he wants to blow his own brain out. And they do right. such an yes. amazing job with that Chekhov's gun with the adamantium bullet. Like for yes, one thing, it do. is such a good character beat of Logan. Like Caliban saying he found this bullet is a wonderful, like Logan is at this point in his life where he is, like yeah. does not care anymore. The only mm -hmm. reason he's sticking around is that Xavier is someone he wants to take care of and that the second Xavier is gone, he's going to kill himself. And like, that is such a like, wow, like th this is where you're at, but it's also setting up that bullet for act three, which is fucking yep. brilliant. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Yes, it is. It's so cool. Um, But then around this uh, earlier in the movie, he'd been at a funeral and, and um, as a driver. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Gabriella, saw him and was like we need your help we need your help and he's just like get out of here i don't know yeah. who you are i don't care and we see laura in the back seat looking at him and then he gets a call for a drive okay and he goes to a motel and that's when he talks with gabriella and, and prior to that um what's his name boyd holbrook can't remember the character's name had already talked to him because yeah. he went to the mm -hmm. hospital to pick up medicine uh -huh. he gets into his car and he he explains I think that's after Gabriella sees him the first time. Yeah, it's, after, it's after the funeral, but before they go to the motel. Yeah, so he's he's right. explaining, like, there's someone... Basically, I'm looking for the person who's looking for you. I need you yeah. to help me. Here's my card. Right. And then we do get a little bit of world-building establishing. Right, which we discussed with yeah. the tiger and all that stuff. Yeah. And then he goes to the motel, and he, he, he speaks with Gabriella, and she's like, you need to help this girl. And he is not super keen on doing that he and and she's she, offering him money she and, needs her him to take her to north dakota or is it first canada north dakota <sighs> and then cross into canada yeah. yeah 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 um which you pointed out which is fun and cool is that you know wolverine is from canada so it's like the promised land is going back to where he came from that's kind of fun mm -hmm. yeah. there, there's a little poetry there and yeah. i like that um but then uh you know he's like no but but then she offers him money and he's like okay i'll come by stay put he goes back to the compound um and then he gets called there again i don't remember how long he stays at the compound of course we don't have to go minute by minute here yeah he basically goes back gabrielle is dead and laura is gone mm -hmm. from what he can tell mm -hmm. and he gets her phone and he sees he sees a text, and th that's a good moment too, where the text is like, "They're already here," or so, it They're says like, something. Here, please hurry, but she never sent it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's like the blinking cursor, you know. And you're yeah. like, "Ah, oh, she was," you know, she gets killed right then and there, mm -hmm. and so she's gone. And and we're assuming that it's a mother and daughter. Yeah, um, that's, she, that's how yeah. she's presented. Yeah, and, although and that's how like, she there's definitely that pause when it's like, and she's your daughter, and that's like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. right. If, if that's easier for you to get you to do this yeah. job for us. Uh, one thing before we move past the motel stuff. So the owner of yeah, the motel yeah. is extremely racist. And I yeah. find that as an interesting detail because there there's a lot of dynamics going on in terms of like the downtrodden people of this world. Like the fact that we start yeah. kind of on the Mexico border um, and there's a lot of like, you know, she she's like, Mama Seat is going to have to pay for blah, blah, blah. Like. The, the whole thing there yeah. is setting up like, again, humanity has gone to a bad place and we're mm -hmm. seeing kind of a version of hell. And then the movie Logan travels through middle America and we get to a, an artificially natural environment from a desert. And then we get to an actual natural environment in the forests of North Dakota crossing into the Canadian border. So we we see this um, this journey out of a hell into a much more mm -hmm. like I, I guess it could be some sort of like Dante kind of experience there. 
Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah, um, that's yeah. interesting. And it's interesting that all the people are set up as being terrible. And like, he, like all the people he's around are terrible in, in casual ways. And again, just shows that like if that racism is so prevalent that like a person just feels like they can talk about like, like talk that way in open public space that like, oh, I guess we're just OK with that kind yeah. of like horrible behavior now. Yeah. 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 Very good point. Um, but then they get back to the compound and Laura was in the trunk mm -hmm. and she starts speaking with Charles. Uh, well, she doesn't speak with him, but, um, and I, I kept referring to, uh, whatever. I, I can't remember the actor's name, but the, him as the Corinthian. So <laughs> any time in my notes, I'm like the Corinthian shows up. The yeah. Corinthian does this or whatever. Uh, Pierce. Pierce. Yeah. yeah. Pierce. Yeah. What is his actor name again, though? I would Boyd like Boyd Holbrook. Void. Boyd. Boyd Holbrook. Like Billy Boyd. Yeah, that's how I'm going to remember it. <laughs> um, yeah, and and so, you know, again, we're seeing this idea of Charles saying, "Hey, we should help this girl," and Wolverine's like, "No, the the world is so far gone. Let's just worry about us two. I don't know who this girl is. I don't care. He can like basically, I can barely take care of you. I can't take care of someone else. Yeah." Um, and yeah. then yeah. the the Corinthian shows up. Oh God, it's Pierce. <laughs> Pierce is such a cool name too. Uh, also, he's a comic <laughs> character too. Um, That's true. The whole Reavers thing is, is a comic thing. I, I am curious for audience members. Hey, who... The Corinthian's a, a, a comic character too. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm curious for audiences who were not familiar with the marketing material for this movie because, like. A big thing was the fact that, like, oh, this girl is Laura, who is X-23, and now actually Wolverine in the comics. Like, that she is a claw-wielding mutant. And I'm curious for audiences who weren't familiar with what this girl was going to turn out to be, like, what the reaction was. Because, like, I, I couldn't go in not knowing who she was, because every commercial showed the claws popping out of her hands at one point. But it's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. Like, they take a long time for that reveal. It's not until after she leaves, having killed the Reavers who went in, went in after her, um, that we find out why it, or like what she is, because like up until that point, it's yeah. just like, Oh, yeah. she's a mutant. Xavier says, but we don't know what her mutant power is. We don't know anything about her. And the fact that she is ultimately Wolverine's daughter is an additional layer of surprise. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I had seen a trailer prior to seeing the movie too. Yeah. So I, I knew that going into it. Yeah. Yeah. That would be interesting. Cause, cause it, the movie is setting itself up as like, Hey, we just got to take care of this girl. And, and, and maybe she has a mutant power, but I don't know if you would automatically assume it's a Wolverine. adamantium situation. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty cool that she has uh foot claws mm -hmm. that, that come out and she's able to kick with those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think they do a shot where Wolverine like notices that. And he's kind of like, there, there's a there's an expression of surprise at, mm -hmm. at that, which mm -hmm. is cool. And it is cool that she just has two claws on each hand. Mm -hmm. So it looks different. It it, it goes differently. And I, I think they even mentioned something about, you know, they definitely do. They mentioned something about how, like, the female would have the... the Offense and defense. Yeah. Yeah, to protect. Her. But that's when Charles is kind of comparing it to, like, lions. Yeah. And, like, the, the, the lioness, like... She takes care of the pride, but she also, like, by going out for the food, but she also protects it. So there is a dual purpose there. Yeah. Yeah, which, you know, I, I think is, is is gobbledygook's fake science for the purpose of right. trying to explain why they wanted the character to look uh, cosmetically different. Um, <laughs> which is... Yeah, I mean, it's like, I don't need an explanation for that. It's just, it just looks cool. Yeah, Mar Marvel has guess... had a long history with atavistic uh human or like augmented humans uh in but by, by way i mean like beast type characters uh and like they there's a weird tradition of like all kinds of permutations of that there was one phase where they were like oh wolverine's not actually a mutant this was earth x where it's like oh he's not actually a mutant he's a, a what a human would look like if they didn't have the x gene added to them ah like oh. <laughs> weird stuff there there was the stanley uh 2009 or or 2099 book uh ravage where they were like oh there was actually ancient humans who had claws and horns uh like oh wow they, they, like okay. weird weird track on all this and the idea that like wolverine's <laughs> daughter would have like a different claw layout just doesn't make any anatomical sense for like how animals work like that that right, level right, right. of sexual dimorphism yeah, yeah, yeah. just doesn't make any sense um but yeah. it was like the only, oh the only thing yeah that that would make sense is because she was basically uh, genetically modified that they can modify that within her. Yeah. And, and add the defense mechanisms 
Well, what, her? I mean, Here, I think it makes sense for say. her to have foot claws. Like, I think, I, yeah. like, there's a when Wolverine has that look. There, I was wondering, like, is, is he wondering, like, have I just never tried to pop the claws of my feet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always felt it was a jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I what I do like about the moment of them clarifying it is, I don't really care what the explanation is, but it does show that that Professor X does have like some lucidity, mm-hmm. and he can yeah. still think like science minded, and he still cares about all of this extra stuff and he's still you know a professor yeah and so so in that regard i i like that they they point it out even though it's like you said it's gobbledygook yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really make any sense when you compare it because even when i was sitting there i'm like yeah but the males have claws on like lion claws are on both all four feet for yeah, both yeah. sexes what mm-hmm. are we talking yeah, about yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean can you imagine if like just women just had an extra toe like, <laughs> <laughs> right that's the toe that protects you know the, the child family. or whatever <laughs> um but yeah so and and i love i love in this moment where laura kills the mercenaries mm-hmm. off screen that come in at mm-hmm. first and then she just walks out and she takes the head of one of them and throws it yeah. at yeah. pierce yeah Whoa. Yeah, and you see how scared Pierce is. We talked about this before. Yes, his yes. his per, his portrayal there is so good. And then you get the slow like claws popping out of her hand again. If an audience member didn't know this was supposed to be Wolverine's daughter, this is such a good reveal. The problem is it every is, commercial yeah. had it. <laughs> right, right. I know. I love I love his portrayal too because I feel like the the easiest way to play it is just he's he's straight faced and tough the whole time. Like, oh, I lost a hand. I've seen a lot of stuff. Yeah. And, he, and he's like probably thinking back to whenever, however he lost his hand when he sees her, whether or not it was her. But it's like, I am so weak compared to this thing. Yeah. yeah. And this is just a child. Like when he pushes yeah. a guard in front of him and like yeah. there's some really good moments there. And, and he's yeah. still so confident when he talks. But like that fear, right. it's it's a great performance by him in, in terms of playing mm-hmm. someone who is like the hand, like like a, like a wolf handler or something or, you know, like. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's great. Um, well, and, and then and then when Wolverine joins in this fight, that's when the harmonica swells. Yes. Um, and of course, it's no secret that this movie is secretly a Western. Mm-hmm. We all know that. Um but I do want to point out something that I noticed when we watched the Wolverine that is very cool is that, um, you know, the Wolverine is harkening back to the Japanese Japanese samurai movies. Uh, it's also very much a western. But as we all know, you know, film started out with the samurais, mm-hmm. and then those inspired the western. So the fact that the Wolverine movies also follow the same trajectory as film is pretty cool yeah, <laughs> yeah I, cool. I i love that i i don't know if that was intentional on their part i think they just liked making westerns mm-hmm. um and made two westerns and one happened to be set in <laughs> Jap- japan but uh it, that's pretty cool that is really cool um yeah and then one thing that i really like and and this is like Again, uh, this reminds me of the beginning of the movie where you have this expectation of Wolverine is just going to kill everybody and it's going to look so cool. Uh, he, but but it's different than that. Like he is driving the limo, escaping with Xavier and Laura, and he drives into a fence. And we're like, we've seen this a thousand times. They just fly through the fence, and he can't break through the fence, mm-hmm. and he has to like move it around, and he winds up whipping it around. But but I think that's a great again kind of purpose of intent for this movie like when the title drops when he's nearly unconscious where it's like yeah things just don't work like that anymore like mm-hmm. he's old he can't do this stuff and even this fence won't break <laughs> like it, it's like everything is against him mm-hmm. yeah and this is not the wolverine movie maybe you were hoping it would be it's going to be better than that yeah, yeah. so then we see the gabriella video and this is where we have like the most amount of this is what's going on because yeah. you know they all escape the compound and then they're like parked on the side of the road yeah and he's watching the video and and we find out that we, i mean we kind of already discussed all this the only thing we didn't discuss was that the now they create mutants with a a, a normal human mother uh and then and then they're able to like take the gene and basically like artificially inseminate with like yeah a it's like a surrogate gene. thing mm-hmm. which is very gross like especially yeah. like it's yeah. like okay we went to mexico so that we could like pay poor yeah. women 
to yeah to, like to experience this and it's it's such, it's such a sick situation and then it's like all right let's exterminate them now that we have a, yeah. a new system yeah and they've like alluded alluded in the video like none of those mothers are still alive like that was their one yeah. purpose that they performed and and all they wanted to do was make soulless mercenaries and soldiers and then when that doesn't work well, i think the idea was they wanted to make soldiers and mercenaries but they because of this failed experiment, they decided to make a soulless one. That's, that, that's, that's what they what thought I was, that they needed to yes. do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do think that Gabriella is a pretty good editor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, that didn't hit me the first time, but the second time I'm like, oh man, she must have spent a lot of time like editing through this footage. I, but I um, do think that there is an opportunity for that to happen because she is trying to create a video to show people how yeah, bad no, stuff yeah, is. Um, so I, I like when, when you're dealing with like a found footage kind of movie, there's always like a, like, wait, who, who cut there? Like, why did they do that? <laughs> yeah. And it, right. this is one of the times where it like makes more sense that someone would like cut yeah, out oh, footage yeah. that wasn't relevant. And like, there would be a note of film at times where we could get good clips. So I, I think it makes enough sense. Yeah. Well, and, and to be clear, that sort of thing does not bother me. I don't care about that sort of thing. I just thought it was kind of funny. Yeah. yeah. That's all. Um, um, one thing we didn't mention is that in the escape, they left Caliban behind, uh, yes. which obviously yes. is going to play a part because, hey, it's the mutant tracking mutant. Okay. Right. Right. How, how do <laughs> right. the bad guys keep up with them the whole time? Yeah. yeah. Um, then they get to the gas station mm-hmm. where where we get we get a little fun, like, parenting stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Because Laura wants to ride the horse, and she keeps riding the little horse outside the gas station, and she starts and, to freak out. Well, what's when it interesting ends. is I think right, right, because he doesn't get to finish the video at the time it dies. Uh-huh. But he he learns that these children have never been outside of this facility. They've never seen a mountain. They've yeah. never seen the ocean. So she, it like makes sense that she's on that ride. It stops. She wants it to keep going, and like she immediately goes to, oh, I have to like hurt this thing, yeah, or destroy this thing in order to get it to work. Yeah. Yeah. And then he has to parent and he doesn't know how. Well, what, so, what do him and, um, him and Charles talk about some stuff pr- before that too. Is Charles still trying to convince him to take her? I think in that so. Scene? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have anything specific that you remember from that? Um, I, I think they agree to like go to the coordinates. Like Charles is really pushing that whole situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Be, yes. If for no other reason, they know that the other children are all like, cause like different nurses took children when they tried to, uh, you know, sequester them away so that we know that Gabriella had Laura, but other, the other kids are also running separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I, I love when she freaks out in the gas station and she's about to like attack or about to really hurt the gas station clerk. And then Logan comes in and he, he stops her and he says, do you have a phone charger? He grabs the phone charger. But he just walks off with it too. Like, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the gas station attendant is just trying to stop her from stealing stuff. (laughs) And so she flips him over and is about to stab him. And and he's like, no, do you have cell phone chargers? And then he just grabs and they walk out. He doesn't like leave money on the table or anything. No, no, no. (laughs) But I do love the, it's just a fun touch where he looks at the cigars and he's not going to grab them. And then he just grabs a handful (laughs) and walks out. And I'm like, heck yeah. I love that. Yeah. He's Um, he's better than Laura, who is just a complete (laughs) wild child at this point, but he's still like, he's still Wolverine. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And, you know, movies about parenting, he doesn't know how to parent. He he did not make that situation better. He just ended the situation. Right. That's all he could think to do. Right. And then just get some stress-relieving cigars. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then they get to the hotel. They watch the movie Shane, which we planned on watching last night because uh, we haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, but... I, I got home it. too late, and uh, I uh, we didn't want to watch a movie. So sorry, folks. I shouldn't have let you know that we didn't do the amount of research as we had hoped. Um, have you seen Shane? I have not. Ah, man. Yeah. Well, I will watch it at some point. Um, but yeah, classic movie, and there's, there's lines that she then says mm-hmm. to um, Wolverine at the funeral, but we'll, we'll save those for then. Mm-hmm. We won't say those now. Um, and then that's when Wolverine goes to a bar and he... Well, he buys a car. And then buys he goes a car, to yeah. a bar. And... and... And he looks at the comics. That's right. And we see this, this like you were saying earlier, this idea that, that there's like the tabloid versions of the X-Men that exists in this world. 
And he's seeing, oh, Eden is just something that's in some comic book issues. And in the issues, there are the coordinates. Mm -hmm. So it's not even, to, to him, it's not even real. And he's basically saying, th this is all mythologies and heroes and fake stuff, and this isn't real. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, there's another element to this movie that's like, never meet your heroes. Yeah. And she's met Wolverine. She's met an X-Men. And it's like, no, you you don't want to meet your heroes. You actually don't want to. It's better to just keep them at the distance of what mm -hmm. you thought you knew. Yeah. Um, so yeah, love love the comic book inclusion. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good good thing to do. And and we've had so many comic book movies at this point that this one to kind of analyze them in a, in a roundabout way by including comics mm -hmm. in the movie and kind of be like, w what are we doing here? What yeah. are we doing? This is all fake. This isn't, this isn't real. Let's look at reality. But then again, the movie, instead of rejecting comics and rejecting these stories, it ultimately embraces them. Right. Which is why I like this, mm -hmm. you know, like that, that sort of thing. Um, and then that, then Charles has the big seizure. Right. At the hotel. Right. Um, which, Which is a crazy awesome scene. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I like the simplicity of the effect, too. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of shaky. Mm -hmm. That's that's all. Yeah, and then the uh, sound effects. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Sometimes I just wish, especially in superhero movies, I wish they would take the simpler route. Because sometimes it's more interesting to look at. And, mm -hmm. and, and it looks better a lot of times. Um, but yeah, so he, he has to, like, fight his way up the hotel room as... He is, I guess, kind of dying and regenerating, and he's using his claws to, like, go through the hallway and carry his body. Um, yeah. And then the the <sighs> the touch of so by the time he gets to the room, the mercenaries are there. He's too late, technically. Yeah. And um, he sees that first guy at the door, and the guy's eyes move to him. Oh, that's such a mm -hmm. good moment. Yeah. And then he slow motion stabs them all okay i know that the movie was kind of being like hey you know this isn't the wolverine movie you thought it was going to be but this moment's a this is a wolverine <laughs> moment where you're like hell yeah let's go yeah like they're all frozen in place because of, of charles's powers and like he's like he's using his claws to like not fall over like he like laura's on the ground like yeah. she like she's able to move too because she's wolverine's daughter but uh right. like the the two of them are the only ones who are able to move at all and she's she's down everyone else is frozen and he just like murders each one of them while they're still there <laughs> uh which is just so f fucking brutal um, I know. The only thing that got me was that they don't fall down, like because they're being held in place by mental force that's like stopping them from mentally moving. But like when they get killed, they don't like collapse, which surprised me only because like then they do when Professor X turns off his powers. So like I don't know uh -huh. how that's all working, but I guess it's just like their bodies haven't even like allowed them to collapse in pain, and I guess they're probably not technically yeah. dead yet. Like they're just yeah uh, mortally wounded. Maybe they're being held in like. In like limbo, yeah. basically. Even though some of them have been stabbed in the brain, they're like dead, but they they're they're dead and they're Schrodinger's cat <laughs> in, yeah. in that moment. Well, and it's such a horrible experience for them, like observing. Yeah. Oh my that, gosh! Yeah. Like, this this being just like coming through and killing them while they can't <laughs> respond. Like you know, it's like um um uh w w like sleep paralysis. Like right. Yeah. 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 But but yeah, and and Laura helps him, and they get the serum in him. They they get it to stop and then they like rush out of the hotel as all these people are like on the ground like moaning in pain. And and Patrick Stewart, come on. He's like crying oh, and looking yeah. around at people and going, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That is a heartbreaking moment yeah. in this movie. And it's just they could have really like played the violin on that and really drawn that out but that's kind of it well it's because there's no time to dwell on it <laughs> oh my gosh because of them, them needing to rush yeah. out well yeah. they have a little bit of time because yeah. everyone's still recovering like pierce is not able to walk after the whole sequence is over <laughs> um which is <laughs> yeah. which is why they're able to get away like and i think it's really yes. they do a yeah. really good job of, of showing that like even the characters who were not directly like impacted by it they just were like frozen for a period by xavier like they are all recovering and it is a terrible experience for literally yeah. everyone Oh my gosh, this movie's good. I'll say it. Uh, <laughs> hey, unpopular opinion? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Very popular opinion. Um, and then they 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 meet the horse trainers. 
they help them, they go to the farm. Because we kind of talked about that scene, too. Yeah. So now we're at the farm. We're seeing, like, a functional family, at least a classically functional family, which is, again, it's interesting, and I just didn't pick up on all of this parenting stuff uh, the first time I watched this movie. Because now we're seeing, like, uh, you know, like the example that that maybe maybe Laura would have striven to experience, and she does not get Mm -hmm. to experience it, Mm -hmm. but she wants Logan to be her dad, I would think. Mm -hmm. Um. And uh, we not only see that side, but we also see these are just normal people existing in this strange future and yes. seeing how it is negatively affecting them. Too. And and a great Patrick Stewart line again, where uh, they talk about how he's a he's a he teaches at a or he, he used to own a school and he mentions about Logan. He says, yeah. um, oh, I wish I could say you were a good pu- pupil, but the words would choke me. Right. <laughs> and uh, delivered by Patrick Stewart, that line sings. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> sweet scene. Yeah, all of them have um, such a yeah. wonderful, like, it, it really helps give them this family vibe, especially, like, having Xavier being presented as the father for Logan. Like, right. like, like lying about that role makes it kind of more real here. And, like, right. it, it helps, like, Wolverine feel it with, with Laura as well. And, you know, see, yeah. seeing this other family and, and then them getting involved and like helping them. And like, you know, there there is a positive benefit to altruism, like to you, like doing good is also like an enriching experience. And you can see that it helps Wolverine himself. It helps Charles yeah. like and seeing that that is a good example for Laura. Like those are those are really good moments there. And like, you know, then we get the more the exposition stuff of like, oh, well, the water is cut off so we have to go out into the cornfields and see again the the terrifying giant autonomous like uh like uh w- like watering systems or irrigation systems that they have set up um mm-hmm. yeah and, and all of that and like have wolverine like side and like he's, he's found a friend like that's great right he, he's got a right. buddy <laughs> right <laughs> but alas it doesn't last well it is it is i definitely interesting so they're they're having dinner with this family. They're done, and the family is convincing them into spending the night. Wolverine is very resistant to it. He wants to not only continue driving, but I think you also know that he wants to continue because when people help him, probably throughout his experience, yeah. innocent people, it ends poorly. Mm-hmm. And we've even seen that just in the movies themselves. Yeah, yeah. Not, not even just the subtext. I mean, it, so I think it, it goes into that like his guilt of violence just in general. Yeah, yeah. throughout. Yeah, yeah. Um. And the well guys show up, and we we have a great uh, great thing where they're they're telling I, I don't remember the 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 dad of the household I think it's Will Munson or something yeah Will they they tell him you know what are you doing you're trespassing and Logan says hey you know back up mm-hmm. and the guy goes your friend has a big mouth and he goes I've heard that before and then he cocks his gun and he goes well then you've probably heard this before too and he's and he says uh uh more than I'd like to. <laughs> yeah (laughs) and uh you know i'm always going to be down for a good a good delivery like that from you jackman (laughs) yeah and then he scares Um, him off without having to use his claws which is like a really good moment yeah yeah right yeah but then he comes back to the house and well while that's happening yeah while it's happening we have what i wrote in my notes as clogan shows up (laughs) yeah and he uh, yeah i I guess because it'd been six years since I'd seen this movie. Uh, I forgot that the family's just all murdered. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And it's pretty sad. Oh, because it's, yeah. it's they have so little screen time, but they really make you attached to those characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the worst of it is what happens to Will. Like, it, it, it's terrible what happens to all of the family. Mm-hmm. But Will himself sees this horrible thing. Like, is a, is assaulted by this like by X twenty four, the Logan clone, and like then like raises his gun to Logan because it, mm-hmm. it it feels like this ultimate betrayal. Um, so not yes, only did right. he, did this family, were they so nice? Did they take them in, like fed them, housed them? Like you could see the friendship starting to form, but then like the, the, the baggage that Wolverine brings with him everywhere, not only murdered them, yeah. but made that man an enemy of him in his last breath. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, I'm glad, I'm really glad you pointed out, that the freight was potentially intentional because um, though I'm okay with, uh, you know, good, good people dying in movies, that's, that's life. I mean, that's, you can do that. 
Uh, it does make it a little hurt a little bit less that Wolverine and Charles actually prevented death just a little bit further, and they were probably going to get killed at some point anyway. Right. Well, because because then the water guy shows up after them. and yeah. like right after that with like armed goons to like gun them all That's down. That's true. Uh, yeah, except and this is like one of those moments where it's just like, oh, too bad, too bad taste tastes great together kind of thing where <laughs> yeah. X-24 Albert Clogan like walks out and they're like, hey, it's that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, no. And then and then that's kind of the th- that's also kind of like maybe what you were expecting from from a rated R Wolverine movie where mm-hmm. it's like it's like oh yeah Quentin Tarantino moment here these guys are going to get their come up and said so you're going to be like all right cool yeah. I- I'm cool with that part <laughs> <laughs> that's the catharsis I thought I was going to get <laughs> um so yeah so he's just tearing them apart and and that feels I think that's the moment where Hugh Grant's kind of like Richard Grant Oh Richard Grant Oh yeah Hugh Grant is um he's in he's in Glass Onion he's that guy um I, the weird movie to to say <laughs> Hugh Grant, but he, he is, is but in yeah. it. Yeah, he's like uh, Daniel Craig's partner. Oh right, okay, yeah. I forgot. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, now I'm like thinking about it. It was such a. There's a lot of cameos in Glass Onion, but that that is by far the the strangest one. <laughs> it's just like, whoa, you got like a huge actor to say four lines. That's crazy. <laughs> um, all of this to say. <laughs> Richard Grant. I almost <laughs> got it wrong again. Richard Grant. Cary Grant. Is, is, <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, yeah, not even to mention him. Uh, he, he's seeing this going down and he's going, hey, X-24, stop. Stop. Come back. Listen to me. And it's not happening. And and this is the moment where he's realizing, like, this also doesn't work. The soulless mercenary doesn't work. Like, like everything I've been trying to do is not working. Yeah. And... um. And Pierce, I mean, again, the fear thing, he's just kind of hanging out. <laughs> he is like not get he's not anxious mm-hmm. to get into the battle here. Mm-hmm. Um and then we have a classic thing that happens. Uh um Caliban gets a little redemption by l- taking a couple of grenades when no one's looking, lighting them up and blowing himself up and only being the one that dies, but attempting to kill some of the bad guys. Yeah. But at least taking um, himself out of the picture because like Caliban mm-hmm. was tortured into helping and like was mm-hmm. doing his best to not help as much as he could. But like, there's only a limit to like what a person can do, especially someone who like had yeah. previously responded in such a way uh, by functioning as like that, as a tracker for villainous groups. Like, he, he like he just doesn't have the willpower in the face of it, and I, it's not a, a a slight against him because who would like right. on, only the most yeah. like resolute people could endure that kind of torture and like completely not give in. And so for him, the way yeah. for him to like resist it is by killing himself. Yeah, um, but they eventually escape. Well, well but he has no, to get Charles. Charles, Charles has been no, yeah, they have to, Tra- they Charles has stabbed initially. Yeah, he fights his clone, but the thing is, when he con- when he comes back. The clone takes Laura and Wolverine mm-hmm. seeing this, his first response is rather than chasing after her, he goes in to check on Charles. Yeah. And that's, again, yeah. a big thing that Charles is the thing that he really cares about here. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, yeah, his I think his. And so much gets, like Shaggy, he says to him, it wasn't me. OK, <laughs> so he, he gets a Charles loads him into the truck and is, you know, telling him, like, well, we're going to get you help. Everything's going to be OK. Hold on. And then Charles just slips away. Yeah, it's it's heartbreaking. It's yeah. truly heartbreaking. I it, it's it was a bummer both times that Charles dies, but mm-hmm. but the story earns it. I'm not in any way saying that the family and Charles shouldn't have died in this movie. I think no. the movie is better because of it. But because I am so invested, it's like no, Charles yeah. can't die. Though. When when Wolverine, like we were saying earlier, when he picks up Charles and is saying like it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't uh, me. It's yeah. so childlike. Yeah. It yeah. really breaks your heart. It really does. It really does. And then, um, then they escape, right? Yeah, they they pin well, yeah, they pin yeah. X twenty three or X. Pardon me, they pin yeah. X twenty four, um, and, yes. and are able to escape. And uh, they 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 head off um, and bury Charles. Uh, yep. And and he says he just says he looks around and he goes, "It's got water. It's got water." Because they were yeah. trying to get to water the whole time. Yeah. And that's also heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, 
And it's just an unmarked grave out there mm-hmm. where the leader of the X-Men is buried unceremoniously. Mm-hmm. And and he Ugh. not only did he die tragically, he died in a way that left Wolverine with some responsibility. Where and I like how it kind of is shown through anger where Laura is witnessing him be like beating up his car because it's not starting. Yeah. Um, and it's because he's angry about Charles like more than anything, but I, I think it's also just like, it wasn't supposed to happen this way. Yeah. You know, and then he passes out. Yeah. And, and this is just a freebie. I know that no one ever watched this movie, but the movie cry macho, uh, Clint Eastwood <laughs> movie was when we were watching it, I was like, Oh, this is what cry macho was trying to be, which is ironic because oh, really? Logan is trying to be other Clint Eastwood movies. But, but like, Cry Macho was basically like, hey, what happens when, like, a hero and a legend has to, like, take care of this child and they're not a hero and a legend anymore? And oh. and when we were watching this movie the other night after watching Cry Macho, I was like, oh, man, he really whiffed that movie. Even more, I thought he whiffed that movie, but now seeing... Seeing it done right. Seeing it done right. And he's done it before. Yeah. In, in the past with other Westerns he's made. Uh, but it was like, oh, man. Like, did you did you not get the memo on this, Clint? Guess not. Anyway, that's just a freebie. Uh, <laughs> uh, then he wakes up. Uh, Logan wakes up at the urgent care, and he looks so bad. Mm-hmm. The makeup and all the stuff they do to him. I mean, he looks horrible. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, we're talking about Hugh Jackman. That's no easy task to make <laughs> the man look bad. Okay, um, so that in itself, I mean, that's crazy. He gets out to the car, um, and the guy's like, you should check into a hospital, but he he says no. He doesn't care. He's, well, I like that there's a reverence, that the doctor has a reverence for him. Like, I never yes. thought I'd get to see one of, one of you, like, specifically you. Right. And here you are here, and all, I want to help you. Let, let me maybe run some tests and, or something. And Yeah. It, it's like he's being treated like a superhero, kind of. And it's yeah. Like, it's like, when was the last time that happened? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, and then he, he gets in the car and he's like, we're not going to Eden. We're not going to Eden. Uh, you know, I I don't know what he has planned to do, but then uh, Laura speaks because mm-hmm. he says, thank you. And she says, de nada. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you can talk. <laughs> and then she, you know, they talk for a little bit and she kind of goes off on like a tangent that's in Spanish. And I have no idea what she says, but then eventually She's mad because they're not going to Eden, and she just starts reciting the names of the other mutants that were with her mm-hmm. over and over. And he's like, "No, we're not going." And then she just keeps reciting them until he's like, "Okay, fine, we'll go. We'll go. You will be proven wrong, and then we'll figure out what to do after that." Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like falling asleep while he's driving. Mm-hmm. She drives for a little bit, or no, no, she dri- She drives him to the urgent care. But she drives later too. She does drive later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then they finally get to Eden. Yeah. Are are we good? Was there anything we we needed to cover in between? No, they're like they don't explicitly arrive at Eden like when they pull off and she's to like rest um and that's when she goes and finds them. Like they they are there effectively like we find out, but um there there is this like moment of her like looking after her dad that I think is yeah. really nice. And it's it's transferring the same relationship that uh Logan had with Xavier. Yep. Yeah. Man, good movie. I'll say it again, unpopular opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is that beautiful conversation where she says, I've hurt people too. And he says, you'll have to learn to live with that. And she says, bad people. And he says, all the same. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Crazy. And that's, what, what was the expression you used when you were talking the about? The tragedy of violence. Oh, yeah, that's good. That's really, I, and that's why we had you on this episode. I didn't know about that tweet, but I'm going to pretend like I did, and that's why we had you. <laughs> um, and then as Wolverine is sleeping, the kids uh, cut his beard to look more like a comic book Wolverine. Well, this kind of reminds me of. Uh, sorry, sorry. This is this moment like kind of reminds me of like Mad Max Two. Is it Mad Max Three? Three. Yeah. Is is there a similar situation where he's being taken care of by children? Yeah, briefly. Yeah, the, the, well, and that's like the last third of the movie. But he's like given some humanity. Yeah, back. yeah, yeah. I love that. I, I was just gonna say. So before they like shave him, like he, they, 
he wakes up being like hoisted up into this like lookout tower by the kids. Like yes. that's right. Like, yes. like the actual arrival at Eden occurs. Um, and he finds like all these mutant kids, which is like has to be like kind of this like at least a little exciting experience for Wolverine because it's all of a sudden there's all these yeah. children mutants that again like, yeah. hadn't been born in 25 years. Yeah. And then and then just just the idea of them making him look more like Wolverine is is I mean talk about something cathartic as a as someone who loves comics and stuff you're sitting there and you're like the kids are doing what what we want to happen to our hero they're they're making him a hero again <laughs> literally yeah. like to to the best of their knowledge yeah. um now we have tracked the progress of Wolverine's hair in every single episode yeah and this is his least Wolverine hair yeah. for the record, but it really works. Yeah, it does. This is they use it to their advantage. And and to put a pin on that nice conversation that we've had throughout, I think for the most part, these movies really do a good job of capturing the Wolverine hair. I think they do too. Yeah. 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 There are a couple of shots Something... in the earlier X Men movies where it's like a little too fake. Uh it's it's <laughs> yeah. it's hard to make, right? The, I, I was gonna say this movie he does not look like Wolverine for the majority of this movie. Yeah. It's when they when they shave his beard down so it turns into giant mutton chops. Like that's where all of yeah. a sudden it's more of the character. And it's like, oh, he's starting to be himself again. Like and he gets to be kind of like he's recovering, but he's like with all these kids and like be like a little bit of a dad, like or like a scout leader mm, yeah. or something like that. Um, yeah. And then and then the third act, we actually get him to be Wolverine again for a minute. Yeah. Right, we do. What when it, what what point in this part though does um, Laura ask him about the bullet because she finds the bullet on him? I, it's around this time, so yeah. we can we can definitely talk yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. I'm I just because because I'm just wondering like he has that conversation with that other kid who seems to be the leader of the group, yeah, Richter, who is ex- Richter. Yeah, he was ex- explaining their plan, and then he gives him the money. It's like you earned it. This is yours. And then he's like, No, you guys need it more than I do. And I just wonder. Uh, in his mind now he's he's seeing their plan they seem to be safe he he's like in a way probably given hope for a future with mutants yeah. and then is like i think i can die in peace now as i'm one i'm wondering if that's what he's thinking yeah because of his uh, original plan to just off himself when he's done taking care of charles yeah and and laura wants him to come mm-hmm. but he's like no this to him is the end of the journey yeah he doesn't need to do anything else but that's of course well, but before that, we see that there's like a serum that that if you if you he, he thinks if you take it, it'll make you crazy. But the kid says if you take a little bit, it just amplifies your powers and it doesn't make you go crazy. Yeah, and we had seen that before. They gave it to X twenty four to heal him after the uh, that's after right. The, yes, uh, being pinned by the by the truck. And then um, he wakes up the next day. He sees drones flying by. All the kids are gone, and he puts together that they have found them, mm-hmm. the bad guys. And he grabs the serum, and and this is this is when you're sitting there and you're like, okay, here we go. This is like good, the bad, and the ugly. He just put on the poncho, and you're like, okay, now it's serious. <laughs> yeah, I think. And he just starts running. Yeah. It did. Yeah. Yeah, because he he doesn't he doesn't inject it till he's caught up to them, right? No, oh. he takes it I initially, so. and then he takes it right right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then he just starts running, and and yeah, because he lets out too, a roar. I, uh, and like, like <laughs> yeah. you don't see it. And then he's just like running and like going at like crazy pace. And this is where we just get this like wonder of him just like slat, like catching up to person after person and just doing the Wolverine thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and he's able to do the lunge, the classic lunge. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I, I like how even before he catches up, uh, it's not explicitly stated or anything, but it just reminded me like, okay, you know, he, he does this, this enhances powers and it's like, okay, now he's, he's the Wolverine and he has to track again. Yeah. Like he's got to go and he's got to find the set and go. Mm-hmm. And so I just love, I love all of that. And then he's, he's taking them all out. You're getting the intensity that you've been wanting. Uh, I, I did mention that the score is quite unusual, but in a very good way. Yeah. Um, and again, the way they're using the harmonicas, and I think they're blending it with one or two other instruments, is just very odd mm-hmm. in a very good way. Well, it's like okay. throbbing. Um, like this whole movie feels like a heartbeat. And for a lot of it, yeah. it's this slow, like, you know, like the, this movie is a slow burn in general. And so there's a lot of that going up until this point, And now it's beating really fast because the like his heart is pumping, yeah. like everything is going like and this like fight is about to happen. 
uh, that is the culmination of everything we've seen so far. Yeah. And, and so it's this big, big fight. Uh, the kids team up against the Corinthian. Yeah. Um, Oh, I, 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 that's, that was not a purposeful one. I just looked at my notes and said, <laughs> Pierce. it. Pierce. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. Um, and they do wind up killing him. Yep. Um, and it, it looks horrific. Yeah. Too. Not great. Yeah. Um, and then, and then it's X 24 versus well, Wolverine, okay, right? But Richard Grant comes out before yes. that. Yes. And, and okay. Does he say, I think you knew my father? Like was his father yeah. striker? I, I believe so, right? No, uh, it, or someone it's else. It's another scientist in it. Like, there's another a character, like, in the in the Weapon X miniseries that, like, first, like, showed the Wolverine, pro- like, him being tortured and experimented on. There's this, like, scientist that has, like, you know, big reflective glasses that they would highlight all the time. And so, like, it, it's oh, supposed okay. to be the, the child of that, like, particular scientist. Got it. So this is like not that. someone we've seen in the films. Uh, No. That he's referencing. Okay. Okay. Um, and it's not by chance the guy who worked on Deadpool, right? No, who, no, like, they're different. They're different characters. Him. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, just confirming. I figured they were different. Um, there's, well, there's Deadpool always the an unlimited like, weapon X stuff. I yeah. think he probably was a part of that whole thing with, with working on Deadpool too. Cause, uh, the whole like, well, weapon X is actually weapon 10. So all the people part of that program were all like roughly contemporaries. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah in the comics they revealed that um weapon one was captain america uh and that oh <laughs> oh okay uh it keeps on going and that there's future it, like later programs after that um but in this oh and, and this it's weapon x and then I, what wolverine was like x1 or something like that and then x23 is the that line of program um okay yeah well uh you know in in the marvel universe there is never a shortage of scientists so um everybody's so smart <laughs> um but yeah so uh well, he he further tries like convince like he, he's kind of still making his case yeah about what they're doing how why it's important to, yeah to get the children um basically i mean still just all all these bad guys are like refusing to see them as children so they're they're just they're ex whatever they are yeah um so but who kills him i don't remember who kills him okay do you, who kills him? Why am I forgetting? Who kills Rice? Um, uh, Richard Grant. Or yeah, Rice. Yeah. Rice. Um, Why is it that this always happens? We get to the always one penultimate scene, or not penultimate. We get to like the ultimate scene in the movie, and I'm like, I don't remember how the bad guy uh, dies. <laughs> Logan shoots him. Oh, okay. I'm I'm not even I'm still not remembering. I, it. I, like, I, didn't I couldn't remember memory. it either, and I'm like looking at Wikipedia. I'm like, oh right, oh that's right. Yeah, no, it is, it is what happens. Yeah. Because okay. like Wolverine, okay. well, the, the drug starts to wear off, um, and so he, yes. right. so while this is all going on, he gets a hold of a gun and he shoots Rice, and that's when X twenty four who sees Rice as his father, because he even though he is like a mostly like mindless like monster, like has some relationship there. That's when he goes berserk and the fight really like goes into overdrive. That's right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and at that point, like you said, Wolverine's the the serum has worn off on him, so it's. It is kind of like there is no chance. Yeah. But the kids just need to get away. And he throws him on the log. Yeah. Like stabs him through the heart. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then Laura knows about the adamantium bullet. Mm -hmm. She shoots him in the head and kills him. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. And then and then she goes to Logan and Logan tells her, don't be what they made you. Yeah. Oh. And then and then he says, so this is what it feels like. Referring to when Charles asked him at the dinner table to just experience the love that's here and experience the family. Like, oh, is that you, what he meant? Because I was thinking death is what he meant. No, when no, I, I well, I think he yeah, he's referring to like I I know what a family feels like in this moment for the first time in my life. Do you think that's what he's saying? Yes. Oh, yeah. I I've always took it as death. Oh, I guess it could be both. Yeah. yeah, he's never well, died. Well, I guess but, like. But basically, yeah. Well, and he's, he's always never been the, felt something permanent. Yeah, like he's that. always just like kept going on. Like everything bad happens, yeah. and then he, but he walks away, and this is the first time where he's not able to walk away from a fight. Yeah. Oh. But I think I think it'd be a dual purpose yeah. for sure. Yeah, because I just yeah. I just think of that moment where he tells him to feel like he says feel the love and like experience what this family yeah, feels like. That's you right. you could feel this feeling, Wolverine, and he never feels it. And then at the end, he says, 
this is what it feels like. And I think, wow. I believe he even does say you could feel this, or he says something with the word feel. That's why I like connected those two. Oh, I did not motifs wow. together. Um, the optimist and the pessimist. <laughs> I guess so. Um, and then, uh, yeah, she calls him daddy. Mm-hmm. Oof. And then we cut to his funeral. Mm-hmm. And she quotes that line in Shane that they had seen in the hotel. Um, I don't. I didn't write down the line. It's a. It's a bit long. I, I, Isn't it? Just, he's kind of like I gotta go on and keep doing my thing to the kid or something. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of similar to that conversation where it's like you can kill and you can you can do wrong and you can do right, but you always have to live with it and you always got to go on. And she she quotes that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And then the moment which. The the first time didn't do it to to me. I mean, I, it it was impactful, yes. But this time, it it actually gave me goosebumps <laughs> when she walks over to the cross, mm-hmm. and then she turns it into an X and walks away. <laughs> and that's why that's I'm some saying powerful that stuff. should have been the last thing from the X Men franchise, like as, like yeah. that from that yeah. iteration of movies. Like we did not need anything. Like again, Deadpool is a separate thing, but like that should have been just right. like yeah. okay, that's it for Fox X Men movies. <laughs> I so agree I, yeah. With I that. wish I wish they knew that like. Because the merger is not, or the acquisition is not for several years, but I wish that it had been sooner and they could have just not put into production. Because then the next time we see the X Men, oh, they're just in the MCU, yeah. yeah, and it could be different actors. Yeah, because Dark stuff. Phoenix yeah. came out, the merger was occurring. I think it was like still obliged to happen, and then uh, yeah, and New Mutants was also like kind of in the same boat of like, well, I guess we're making this movie. Fuck, uh, we'll get it out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we keep pushing it back. We got to dump it at some point. They'd certainly started production on both those movies before Fox was purchased. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, you you are right. This this is the actual ending of X-Men. Mhm. That that of that series. Yeah. That that universe if you will. Yeah. Um and then and then also it freaking ends with Johnny Cash's when the man comes around over the credits. That's so good. <laughs> That's so good. And there's no post credit anything for this. No. I don't think so. I didn't even bother to check. No, I was it was, like, they even commented it'd be on, on, on at the time that it was very deliberate that they didn't want that for this movie. Cool. Yeah. Love that. Well, it, it would have been like, uh, I just remember seeing Endgame and just being like, when the credits rolled, I was like, oh my gosh, I love this movie. That was so good. I can't believe how good it was. And as the credits are going, I'm like, don't you dare do a credit scene. Mm-hmm. That would ruin this. I maintain in, in a that way. Stan Lee talking to the Watcher could have been a good, like, or, well, or rather. If it was Stan Lee related, that would be different. Yeah. Great. yeah. I, I, I really. But he was, he had passed by then. Uh, they filmed stuff with him. He's in, he's no. in Endgame. Uh, they, they DH him, yeah. which is like a weird last scene for him. <laughs> but I, I. Yeah. And he's in Captain Marvel. That's his last one, which was. Well, Captain oh, no, Marvel came before, before. Endgame. Uh, his no, his wait, last yeah. appearance is in in the seventies. They show he like shouts from a That's car right. at them, and it's like that. I, I would have liked to have like one more where he's because they had established he's a, like a watcher or something like a watcher, and have him on the moon yes, looking right. down and just say, yeah. "I'm a true believer." And then like that yeah. that would have been <laughs> that would have been pretty that cool. Been dope, but you know, or just saying Excelsior, one of those two. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but. uh yeah, that's Logan. This mm-hmm. movie is fantastic. Um, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> earlier this year, the first series we covered this year was uh, The Man With No Name. So this is a good, you know, good. this year has been full of the Western in a way, even though it's mostly been X-Men movies. <laughs> 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 but yeah, that's that's what I have to say. Any final thoughts from you two on Logan? I think this movie is just so well constructed again, like set up and payoff is so laid out throughout this whole movie. Like the world building is really yeah. solid. Like the, it, it's such a slow burn. And like, it, while it is a really good standalone movie, it really rewards you to have like a cultural understanding of superhero movies. Like one of yeah. the conversations yep. I've had about the, like the problems with trying to do, so much of the like in game or not in game, like the movie, but like the in game stuff of superhero comics, like to do dark Knight returns references or to do the doomsday fight with Superman. Like the reasons why those are difficult to pull off in a movie now is because we don't have the, the world that those are trying to subvert. Like Watchmen as a comic is a subversion of comics of the day. Watchmen, the movie came out before the MCU was a thing. So like, it's just not the same, like we're not, 
we're not responding to the same stuff. This is a movie that is subverting all of the expectations of, at this point of what X-Men movies had been about. And like yeah. by extension, mm-hmm. the superhero movies that had come with it. But X-Men was part of, you know, it's it's Blade, then X-Men and Spider-Man are the three movies that like launch like the modern landscape of superhero movies. And so that X-Men franchise to have like a send off that is like, yeah, no, there was like all these big, crazy events. Like we were on the Statue of Liberty. We did all like we were superheroes. Yeah. And like at the end of the day, we are old and tired and in pain. And all that glamour and, and glory that we had is so far gone. And to do a commentary on that in this movie, it's it's just really excellent. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and again, like only can happen if you have like that whole sequence of movies leading up to it. Yeah. Yes. L- Logan yeah. coming out as just a first movie for fun does not carry the weight that this movie does. Mm-hmm. Or even like the fifth or sixth movie, like, like you're saying. And not just even X-Men, like having so many superhero movies that we've seen by now this movie just stands out amongst most of them yeah. because mm-hmm. it is subverting those expectations yeah and like we've got hugh saying. jackman and and patrick stewart but like especially hugh jackman who we've seen so much in this role and to then show his like send off to the character it works really well like yeah yeah this movie would have worked okay in a vacuum but this movie is great because it is not yep yeah love it so well said yeah. <laughs> well, hey, Case, what do you got to plug? <laughs> uh, well, if we did if, it, if people want more of my movie takes, they should check out my movie podcast, which is Another Pass, where we look at movies that we find fascinating but flawed and discuss all the, the hurdles that went into the production and speculate on what could have realistically been done at the time to make them a little bit better. And then every five episodes, we look at a movie that had terrible production issues and they overcame it through creativity, basically as a proof of concept of what we're talking about on the regular episodes. Yeah. So uh, when uh, when we're recording this, we just concluded our lead up to our 150th episode where we covered the Planet of the Apes movies in reverse order, uh, wow. <laughs> going from battle all the way, working our way to our 150th episode where we celebrated the monumental clusterfuck that was behind the scenes for the original Planet of the Apes uh, <laughs> and, and how amazing that movie ended up being. Uh, so yeah. that's yeah. Uh, just yeah. as an example of that one. Uh, but then when we talked about Beneath, we were like, a lot of stuff we would do different because that movie's not very good. Uh, we had some trouble with uh, Escape and Conquest because those movies are, are baller. Uh, <laughs> Conquest or Escape is so good. It's a 70s slice of life comedy. <laughs> um, oh, my so gosh. Another Pass is my movie show. Check that out. We have a lot of fun talking about all of all of these kind of stuff. We've done tons of superhero stuff, um, but it's just we, we like to talk about movies that we find interesting, but like wish they could have been a little bit better. Um and then if you'd like mostly my superhero takes, check out Men of Steel, which is a Superman and Superman adjacent podcast. Uh, so we'll talk about Superman, but we'll also talk about stuff like Invincible or like the idea was just to sure. sort of like celebrate, like look at this this archetype of the Superman and like the, like those kind of stories, because a lot of a lot of media has shifted towards like, man, Batman's so cool. But it's like but, but it's also just fun to imagine flying or to imagine being able to like <laughs> yeah. do, do something good because you have power. Um and yeah. like that's what a lot of superhero fiction tries to tell you. This movie ultimately settles on that that standpoint. Someone has shown up. You have the power to fix things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we like to like look at those kind of stories. Um, when this episode is being recorded, we just are finishing up our coverage of the death and return of Superman in the arc or in the comics. Um, so check all that out. That's a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, uh, we've got YouTube stuff on certain POV media. So check that out. We do clips of our shows and we do I do videos on Superman analogs uh, that I've been running for like two years now. Which, or we're in our third year of doing a weekly video on this character is like Superman for X reasons, blah, blah, blah. Cool. <laughs> so, cool. Uh, check all that out. Uh, you can find all of that at certainpov.com. Cool. cool. Well, and as, as far as we're concerned, uh, give us a rating. Mm-hmm. Give us five stars. Do it. And give another pass and Men of Steel five stars when you're done. That's what I'm going to do right when we end this episode. I'm going to head over there. And uh, and go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Micah McCaw, and you can listen to our episode this month, our bonus episode, on Kick-Ass. And the next month, Kick-Ass 2. Cool. What uh, month are we in? We, we are... Yeah, this might change some of the things you were just talking about, Case. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are in the month of May right now. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, last week last week we just saw Fast 10. Did we though? And we covered it. 
Did we just skip it? We we may have skipped it because maybe maybe uh, you're too pregnant to go and yeah I don't think I'll be feeling well yeah then we don't day. have to watch it <laughs> I mean I mean we totally want to watch it yeah um, it's fast but thank X. you for imagine listening. it's an X Men movie it's fine <laughs> ah, yeah. ah that helps that that will help um yeah so thank you for listening everybody and we'll see you next week when we cover. Uh, well, actually, let me look at the calendar because it gets confusing with these movies. Podcast time is uh, Deadpool real weird. Two. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. really is. I, I have like, I guessed it on like three or four podcasts, and I, I work this way too. But they're so far ahead. It's like I don't even know when that did they can that or is that episode coming out? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Deadpool Two next week. All right, bye everybody. Bye. <laughs>